Hello again, friends, and Happy New Year! And you are our friends. And welcome back to another edition of Jim Cornette's drive Through right here in a brand new year, on a brand new day, whatever day it is that this has come out. I'm your host, the great Brian Last. We have a lot of things to go over. Questions, reviews, and who knows what else with this man. The leader of the cult of Cornette. This f***ing chair. Mr. Jim Cornette! <laughs> All is quiet on New Year's Day, except for Brian Last's squeaky chair. Do I sound like Boner? His name is Bono. 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 It's Bono. Bono. What, are you, what are you talking about? Did anybody ever call Sonny? Hey, there's Sonny Bono. For heaven's sake. Well, he's Bono. I've forgotten how to do this. It's been a while since we did this. What's been going on, Brian? Oh, it's a whole new year, a whole new, as you just said, and I'm going to repeat your rotten intro, a whole new day, a whole new show. We're back. Omnibuses have been flying. They're still flying. As a matter of fact, we'll talk about that later on, but we're back with brand new programming in a brand new year. And it's, I, this has proven Brian Last, I'll have you know, and, and to the cult of Cornette out there, Happy New Year to you. This has proven my old adage. How can I miss you if you won't go away? The last few weeks before Christmas, I was starting to are we doing a show again? Do it seem like we just did a show yesterday? Are they we can't do substandard shows? I don't know if my heart is in it. Oh, I've been just a nervous Nelly, a nattering nabob of nervousness that the shows weren't living up because it just seemed like it was starting to be a bit of a chore. And then the holidays come along, the break, as Jimmy Hart used to say, brand new pay uh, what, what did he used to say? Is that what he said? <laughs> brand new pay <laughs> Brand new <laughs> God, shut up. That famous All Jimmy right, Hart saying, we're, we're, brand we're, new pay <laughs> Brand new what Jimmy Hart used to say was paint up, fix up, clean up, a brand new coat of paint, <laughs> shine up and, and get out there and I don't know, fucking do whatever. But anyway, now we've had a brand new coat of paint on us. That's and then it seems still, like the same why, old paint I've been inhaling the paint fumes, apparently. Seems like the same old paint. <laughs> Ask me. <laughs> old old paint. It used to be my horse when I was a little boy. Old paint. But, but now I've almost forgotten how to do that, but I've been excited because things have been going on. There's things been happening over the last of the old year and the first of the new year. And I'm gonna save some of that for the experience this week. Cause I can't just blow my whole fucking stash of topical discussion here on your program, Not and far be it from me to ever hijack this show and take it in another direction, because you are the captain of this ship, the pilot of this plane, the the man at the steering wheel, the, the, the ferry man that is taking us across this journey. I am but a humble servant, but I'm going to talk about a couple of things. Because first of all, I got a lot of problems with you people. We're airing the grievances from Festivus. When did everybody go out of their mind and decide that just because it's like 4th of July, New Year's Eve, we got to blow up half the neighborhood? I'll have you to, we had a wonderful New Year's Eve here at the castle. Stace and I and Harley Quinn, we, I got these 24 ounce ribeye steaks from the meat uh, gentleman over there at the store. He, he actually cut them off the ass end of the cow for me special. And we ordered, Stacy ordered on, on the internet, internets or interwebs or whatever, Stacy ordered the G&M crab cakes. I've told you about this. is not even a paid announcement, but they're the best fucking crab cakes in the world. John Fell uh, first introduced us to these things. And G&M Crab Cakes in, in Baltimore, in Maryland, look it up. They send you the crab cake mixture, and you just put it right out on a pan and bake it. It's the best crab. It, it better than anything you'll have in a restaurant in Baltimore. It's amazing. So we had steaks and crab cakes. And Harley Quinn had her little treats. And we had just settled down in bed with all of the blankies all around. 
and turned on me TV to watch Svengooly Earth versus the Spider. And goddamn the people in this new subdivision, some knucklehead back there that's got more time and money than he's got common sense, decides at 8.30 at night to shoot off fucking fireworks and Harley starts barking. It torments the animals, people, for fuck's sake. It's not because there's a lot of people living around here in this area now. It's not just the wildlife anymore. It's, it's people's poor domesticated rovers and pussies and things and such. But anyway, so Harley gets all upset, and we have to calm her down and give her belly rubs. And then finally got tuckled back in or tucked back in or tickled back in or whatever. And I'll have you know that the spider was, was ahead. Earth was, was not doing well. And son of a bitch, I went to sleep, and I don't know who won. I don't know if Earth made a last-minute comeback or if the spider fucking wiped the, the web with him. But we had set the alarm for midnight. So the alarm went off, and we both woke up and said Happy New Year and then went back to sleep. So that was a wonderful New Year's Eve, except for the fireworks asshole. What did you do for New Year's Eve there, great Brian Last? Just hung out with the family, then I watched Twilight Zone. Some honeymooners. <sighs> well, I'm glad it was so interesting. Did you hear any fireworks? No, no one's fucking around in this neighborhood. No one's fucking around in this Well, you've got the militia stationed at, at every corner. I'll have you know, by the way, the weather report, for those of you who have been waiting with, with anxiety to find out if we got out of the 20-something below wind chill that we had the last time that we actually recorded a new program, the Friday before Christmas in Louisville, Kentucky, the wind chill was 28 degrees below zero. The Friday before New Year's, the air temperature was 68 degrees. A hundred degree swing in seven days. And over the past couple of days, and it's continuing on today, we've had fucking, I got up at five o'clock this morning because of the thunder and lightning. It was uh, January 3rd in Louisville, Kentucky. It was 60 degrees at five o'clock in the morning with thunder and lightning and torrential rain, tornado warnings to the south of us. And we're all under a flash flood warning. Cornette Creek is fucking flowing back there, baby. But now we're going to drown in January. And speaking of drowning, did you happen to catch the Great Kentucky Shootout on New Year's Eve, Brian? I know that's something everybody in New Jersey pays attention to. I did not. I don't even know what you're talking about, but I'm dying to find out. The University of Louisville and the University of Kentucky, the Cardinals and the Wildcats, play each other every year, Christmas week, New Year's weekend, sometimes in that general vicinity. And, of course, that is, or used to be, <laughs> if, it, if it hadn't already lost its luster, then it's fucking stinking a joint out after this weekend. But it used to be the hottest ticket in the state of Kentucky. The rivalry between the University of Louisville Cardinals and the University of Kentucky Wildcats between the red and the blue between Louisville and Lexington is as rivaled in the state of Kentucky's history. The Hatfields and the McCoys and the all, and any feud that Granny Moses Clampett got involved in on the Beverly Hillbillies, this is the biggest rivalry in the history of sports, right? And it has been for 50 years. But 50 years ago, the University of Louisville Cardinals, the 70s, they were coming on. The Wildcats had gotten all the attention for all the years, and the rich, snooty people that send their kids to college over there in Lexington have all the horse money and the oil money and the fake money. The counterfeiters made a lot of money. But anyway, they sent them over there to Lexington while the the common, ordinary, everyday Kentuckian went to the University of Louisville, the, the, the team of the common man. But the Cardinals start coming along and getting all the, getting more of the attention. And Denny Crum, a Hall of Fame basketball coach, one of the greats of all time, studied, assisted under the 
legendary John Wooden of UCLA. Denny Crum was the coach for 30 whatever fucking years, right? Built the program, the 1980 NCAA title for the Doctors of Dunk, led by Dr. Duncanstein, Daryl Griffith himself. We were national TV stars. The NCAA finals that year on network television did a huge rating. There's Louisville represented. It was Daryl Griffith's senior year. He went out with a bang. Got the high five over. The fucking Cardinals were a band for 30-something years. After that, the University of Louisville Cardinals were a big fucking deal in college basketball. But then Denny Crum has to retire. Just He can't be a day over 85 right now. I don't know why he had to fucking go. I think they ran him off. But anyway, we get that fucking slick-haired, no-good, immoral New Yorker, Rick Patino, comes in here, big, big coaching resume, and what happens? Over the last 10 years ago, the Cardinals were the NCAA champions. And they also kicked the shit out of the University of Kentucky Wildcats that year, as I recall. Because previous year, Kentucky had been champions. But nevertheless, Patino, first there's a recruiting scandal. They said they brought hookers to the fucking recruiting thing for the to try to entice the players to come. That's like taking a ham sandwich to a smorgasbord. If you're a University of Louisville basketball player in this town, you don't need to get professional help. And then Patino gets fucking blackmailed for uh, he fucked some woman in the bathroom at Carabas over on Hersburn. And and then they try to blackmail him about that. And then there's more. There's payoffs to Nike or whatever the fuck and recruiting violations. And then they had to give back the national title. And Patino gets fucking dumped. And they get some guy that looked almost like the corpse referee, Rick Knox over at AEW, some bald-headed white boy to be the coach for a couple of years. They've lost all of the, all of the star recruits that they could have had and said, fuck, we ain't getting involved in that. And everybody fucking fled to other schools. And I'll have you know that this year, and in Rupp Arena in Lexington, where not only are they like uh, in the great Kentucky shootout between Louisville and Lexington, they're like fucking 80% or better in Rupp Arena, but they haven't lost a home game there in 27 fucking games right now. And it's the University of Louisville under new coach, Kenny Payne, who actually was a player years ago and been played in the NBA. He's very popular in town now, considering what he's following. But the team goes in. Brian, guess what their record is? Kentucky was eight, I think eight and four. Guess what the Cardinals' record was coming into this game? I don't know. Two and 11. Two and 11. Because I stopped a couple of years ago, I stopped paying a bit of fucking attention because of all this shit, right? It's like this is how you run off fans in wrestling or basketball or whatever else. Too much fucking bullshit. Too much bullshit going on. They came in at 2 and 11. And at one point, they were down 30 points. But I'll have you know that they staged a miraculous comeback and only got their ass kicked by like 25 points. And they're now 2 and 12. I don't remember since I was this little small child in my mother's arms, clinging to her bosom, that a University of Louisville basketball team has ever been 2-12. and 12. So that was the New Year's weekend down here in Kentucky. Who's the big rivalry up there in basketball in, in New Jersey? I don't give a shit. Do you I used to love the Knicks, a- but the Knicks have sucked for so long and I hate their owner that I just can't give a shit anymore about my local basketball team. No, I'm talking the colleges. Yeah, fuck the colleges. Oh, for you you'd get beat with a stick if you came down here and said that. Yeah, let's see what I got. You got a stick. 
there hasn't been a a professional basketball team in the state of Kentucky. Said what? When did the Colonels fold to the ABA? Nineteen seventy one, whatever the fuck. But at the same time, college basketball is by far the hottest fucking sport of any kind, professional, amateur, or whatever. And this, why do you think they built Rupp Arena to seat fucking twenty six thousand people? It wasn't because they had so many touring bands that was coming to a a town of, at the time they built it, 150,000 people and selling that building out. It was for fucking Wildcat basketball. Do you think wrestling promoters stole from the NCAA in terms of how to not pay your talent? No, I, actually, the NCAA has gone to wrestling promoters one better because they, they you know, didn't pay them at all. At least the promoters paid, paid them enough to kind of keep them around wishing for more. It's like, well, that, that was nice. Maybe he'll give me some more. But no, the, well, that's, that's, they pay them in hookers. It just, the clumsy colleges get caught, apparently. Now you got my chair cracking. My chair's not squeaking, it's cracking. I'll tell you what's not cracking. <laughs> you want to know what's not cracking, Brian? I don't know what you're transitioning to. Yeah, what's I'm not cracking? I'm telling you what's not cracking. The feather bottoms resolve. The Feather Bottoms have just completed their first year of service to the Cornets Collectibles customers at jimcornet.com and they are signed up for another year. They're going to do their, they're going to be fucking those packages, the Feather Bottom Ultra Careful Handling System. They're going to be fucking those packages for another year to they've they've re-signed. I actually I had a a rollover clause, where, you know, but uh, but nevertheless they're they're hard at work right now, counting all the items, sorting all the items, restocking all the items. The merchandise store at jimcornet.com is closed currently, but will reopen on Monday, January 9th, after everything's been counted and resupplied and ready to serve the customers. And they will serve the pub, they will service the public like the public has never been serviced before in the year 2023. And one more thing, and I, of course, this is your show, and I don't mean to lead you in a different direction, but a lot of people have been asking this. When is Jim Cornette going to get back on the cameos? Because, Brian, do you remember the last time that we offered cameos? I think that's before you started dressing nice again. Well, I, I'm not saying I'm going to dress nice on the cameos. It's still not, you know, national cable, but nevertheless. It was last Valentine's Day, the St. Valentine's Day Massa Cameos. It has been almost one year because we got sidetracked over here with the remodeling project and action figure Armageddon, and we've been working on some other different projects that the people will find out about in the next several months, and I have not done cameos. So, for the people who may not even know, the cameos are the personalized video greetings that I give to people. Actually, I don't give them to you, purchase them, and then I send them to you. And it can be either a positive or a negative experience. If you want somebody blessed out, as my first grade teacher Myrtle Reed used to say, then I can do that or I can say things in a positive fashion as well, but it's tailored to your specifications. You can go to cameo.com slash Jim Cornette for more information, or you can just go to jimcornette.com and click on the cameo button at the top of the Zabadai up there, and it'll route you right to the place. And uh, those are going to go on sale. They're not up now. Saturday, January 28th at noon Eastern. And for the newer listeners, the drill is we limit it to what we can do that week. Uh, Hotchkiss Featherbottom is also my ace cameraman, and we limit it to whatever we can do that week of uh, shooting in a two-day period of time where we can clear our schedule, which is usually about 75 or 80. So on January 28th, Saturday at noon Eastern, if you click on the Cameo button or go to cameo.com slash Jim Cornette, they will miraculously be on sale and you can put in your specifications and your order. And if, do, from previous history, 
since we're only going to do 75 or 80, I would suggest if you don't hop in in the first two hours or so, uh, they're going to be gone before you get there. But otherwise than that, Brian, this is your program, and who would I be to try to lead this thing in my own direction for my own self-serving purposes? I think you'd be a selfish, filthy man, but... Filthy, filthy, nasty man. Well, Jim, we have plenty of time to go over some fun stuff. And of course, we have some reviews and questions, some big topics, big things happening in wrestling. But before we go any further, I want to talk about something serious that just happened over the last few days. I saw it on Twitter, a tweet from Mike Tanay announcing it, that his former broadcast partner, Don West, I guess most famous in wrestling for TNA, his commentary in TNA, I should say, just passed away. And I know we've talked about it in the past is battle with cancer, lymphoma, I believe. And Jim, what are your thoughts and uh, anything you want to say about Don West? Well, yeah, you know, it obviously it wasn't unexpected because we had mentioned, I think it was, you know, probably what, three or four months ago was his GoFundMe, which still may be active. I don't know. And if, if you can search it out, but, um, you know, we were having some fun with Scott Demore and cause he was matching all the donations that week. So we amplified it a little bit. And I think we, Stuck to more for about 15 grand and he loved every minute of it uh, because it, a lot of people tweeted about I've made mention. I don't tweet about people dying anymore because it's just, uh, you know, what do you say? And blah, blah, blah in a tweet. Uh, but the outpouring from everybody that had ever worked with Don or even that didn't know him, Michael Cole, uh, and obviously with approval. Uh, mentioned it on SmackDown this past Friday. <laughs> and the, the WWE as a company in the producing the Ric Flair video completely overlooked his five years or whatever in TNA. It was never mentioned, but they mentioned Don West on SmackDown on network television. That's everybody loved Don West and you couldn't not if you ever met him. And that, you know, he, and he was even good natured. He took some heat uh, early on from people because he had absolutely no wrestling experience. You know, uh, Jeff, I think, and and his dad, Jerry, one or the other, both had seen Don on uh, the Home Shopping Channel. I mean, Don had even been parodied on Saturday Night Live, you know, from Shop his at work home. in, or Shop at Home. One, one of the, I'm, I'm not fluent in all the various shopping channels but whatever the big one was and he was the star of it Let's i used to watch that, that oh yeah because i used to buy baseball cards even before he got into the mark mcguire rookie card which became his most notorious thing for screaming on there but <laughs> i used to watch him you know the same time i was watching the monday night wars i was watching don west selling baseball cards at night well and that's the thing he was a gimmick before he even got involved in wrestling and i say that in a nice way because not like he had a gimmick don was a gimmick back in the good old days when guys were gimmicks rather than adam he was just an over the top personality he had that drive and that oomph and uh, you know the the yelling and the over the top because he had that voice and i don't know how he kept it he just had that the you know, the voice, the ability to do that, and the infectious enthusiasm, and he could pitch anything and sell anything, and, and that's what they liked about, you know, Don's work on Shop at Home, so then they said, well, maybe this will work for wrestling, and like I was saying, he took some heat early on from the family, this guy doesn't know anything about wrestling, but he, instead of you know, being an asshole and go, well, fuck, this ain't any, you know, this isn't serious anyway. He actually learned and tried and he got to know the guys and they got to know him. And he got, you know, he's sitting there next to Mike Tanay, who is an encyclopedia of wrestling knowledge, but also had broadcasting experience, you know, in wrestling so that he could help, you know, Shepard Don there. And he got good at it in, and still was himself in his own way but he never shit on the business or didn't take it seriously or, you know, he was involved in some goofy things until weren't we all because of, you know, the loose nut behind the wheel in that, you know, vehicle, but he didn't shit on the wrestling business because he came from outside of it or not take it seriously or whatever. And, you know, that was the big thing is you saw everybody, not only people from TNA and an impact, but, 
you know, people that have gone on to other companies and just everybody, you know, they, they liked Don West. He was great to be around. And that's, I've told many times the best part of my experience at TNA was either sitting in the back with Dutch Mantel when we get people to leave us alone or after the production meeting in the production meeting room, getting a chance talking bullshit with Tanay and West while all of our, you know, stray stepchildren were still arriving before I had to go actually argue with people about shit. So, you know, I, but you know, obviously he had had an issue, I guess, or about with it once before, and then it had gone into remission and then it came back, I think probably about what was it? Maybe even less than a year ago, he announced that it was back it, it in the years since he'd been out of wrestling, he had uh, taken a job. He was in Washington state and what is the name of that town? Wenatchee? He'd taken a job with a minor league sports team up there and then had started doing a radio show. And Don was perfect for radio also uh, because he, again, the voice and the infectious enthusiasm and he could talk about anything. But that's, a, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that at one point, probably TNA was grossing more money from the merchandise that Don West was selling than the fucking tickets to the shows. Because he was the one that was Still coming is. up with, and probably yes, <laughs> um, you know, I mean, he would come up with the, the offbeat merchandising ideas or ways to pitch stuff or, you know, we're not just selling you an autograph picture. We're selling you an autograph picture on a plaque with the, a piece of the ring mat from this specific pay-per-view, the blah, blah, blah. And, you know, he was just a, a, a whiz at that stuff. and. Yeah, he made him a, t a ton of money from the people they could suck in to, to uh, go to a show or to get online. He was doing pretty good per head, but it was and, and he made he made it valuable because he made it something and gave them a lot of ideas behind the scenes like that. Do you think whether it's a Don West? Or a Gene Okerlund, and again, there's a difference between an announcer and a commentator, although Gene Okerlund did some commentary, but do you think there's a trait in natural salesmen that make them better than others as wrestling commentators, announcers, whatever you want to call it? I, you know, in, in some cases, yes. I'm not going to say, you know, in every... I, I don't know that Gordon Soley would have been a great siding salesman, you know, but at the same time, he was more of the analytical, you know, professorial type. Whereas, you know, a guy like Don, especially because, because Mike Tanay is a laid back personality and is so not over the top that it worked. I don't think, and or like me and Dean Hill on OVW television or, you know, what a lot of duos like that are one guy's over the top and one guy's laid back and you can kind of mesh. Um, but as far as, you know, a salesman, I think that it, it helps in any television business or any television endeavor, whether it's wrestling or anything, especially today with short attention spans and, you know, people clicking around. If you can snatch them with the meat of the matter and get them hooked on before they even know what you're saying, kind of how you're saying it with some enthusiasm or some excitement or some if the situation calls for it, anger or animosity or just, or happiness, some emotion instead of just, well, now the news, you know, the, it used to be, uh, I will give modern times that with uh, three or four channels, you had a minute or two where you could get to your point before, you know, people are going to say, well, there's three other things on, maybe I might like one of them. Well, now there's 500 things. so. I think today you need somebody that for some reason the people want to listen to before they necessarily know what they're talking about for wrestlers, announcers, or anybody else for that matter. Well, Jim, let's change the topic, but actually stay on the note of passings. 
What are your thoughts on the passing, the word that just got out, I heard from Scott Cornish this morning, the passing of one of your very good friends, Fred the Elephant Boy? I hadn't, I, okay, thanks uh, for surprising me. I had no idea. What happened? I don't know. I'm just hearing this uh, as we Well, how do we know we can trust Cornish? Well, I got actually more He's, he's a, a noted liar and a prevaricator. That's not true at all. I got other tweets from other people saying that Fred the Elephant Boy has indeed passed away. Uh, um, you know, I didn't know Fred that well and his brother Kid Vicious. Um, I would see them on Dennis Corluzzo's shows when we would come up. I mean, they were big wrestling fans, and, you know, Dennis uh, booked them quite often, and they would be at, you know, the occasional wrestling fan convention or whatever the case. But he was a nice guy. I I actually never really knew what the complete deal was with the whole thing. And and hey, well, you you being a Stern aficionado, how did he get involved with the Howard Stern show? I think I've heard the story, but it's been twenty five years. I'm not exactly sure either. I think someone just said to maybe Gary Delabate or someone. I know this guy. You guys got to get him on the air because he could barely speak English, and he's weird. And they did that, and he became somewhat of a hit. But well, but the okay, but the the story of how he was named the elephant, and now somebody is going to probably quote chapter and verse of some book Howard Stern has written or something where it's in there. But basically, he was on, he was a caller on the air, and then somebody else called him an animal or something. He said, "I'm not an animal. I'm a human." And they said, "Oh, he's the elephant boy." That's how he got his name, from what I was told in the locker room years ago in, in New Jersey. So it must have been true. One of the but, big uh, questions, though, is how did Howard get him on the air, make him into a whack pack superstar, and never do anything with his brother? Because Kid Vicious, if you think Fred was the show, Kid Vicious was the show. Yeah, they were an entertaining pair, and, and the kid was even more over the... Because Fred was kind of like the normal one when when they were both around. and the. And he was a normal guy. He just he had a speech impediment and he was some odd quirks about him in general, but he was a nice guy. So I'm sorry to hear. And how old could he have been? Maybe uh, like late 50s, if I had to guess. Well, I guess that's I was gonna say he couldn't be any older than me, but I guess I'm old now too. Hey, I have some audio here. Let's see if uh it plays all right, because I hate to say this was one of the first things I thought of when I heard that he passed, but this is classic. Remember when Dennis, for a brief while, was actually a regular heel manager in Memphis on Memphis TV in 92? Yes. And he said that Fred the Elfin Boy and Kid Vicious were Jerry's illegitimate children, Brian and Kevin, and that Jerry Lawler won't pay child support. Yes, yeah, that was a, folks, in the summer, was it the summer of 92? That was a, <laughs> an angle that was going on in Memphis that these two... Uh, uh, well, the two brothers, one of a, a Stern Show uh, celebrity and, and his offbeat brother were actually the illegitimate children of Jerry the King Lawler. Neither one of them could speak English well. Jerry Lawler, of course, being one of the greatest linguists in wrestling history, but let's hear some audio here. Dave Brown introducing this crew. Match coming up Monday night, Coliseum, 8 o'clock when it all begins. Dennis Carluza back again. All right, Jack Brown, listen to me. You know, I never like that smirk on your face. And I'm also forgetting my manners. I forgot to tell Lance Russell he's gotten a heck of a tan since I last seen him. But I've had it with these stinking people in this town. I've had it with, these st with the stinking town. I've had it with that stinking Jerry Lawler. Let me tell you something. You see me soften him up for Mike Dorgendorf there a little earlier? I'm going to bring somebody out right now, two people. I'm going to bring Jerry Lawler's sons out right now. Brian and Kevin, come on out here. These kids... Or who I'm going to be talking to. Hey, hey, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you if you followed any of this over the months or not. These are not Jerry Lawler's kids. I'm sorry. <laughs> they are Jerry Lawler's kids. Come here. Turn around here. Look, in, look at that profile, the regal chin, the regal nose. Let me tell you something right now. I want all you people, please, just for a minute, to shut your eyes and listen to Brian Lawler talk, and you would know his voice from Jerry Lawler's. Brian, say a few words. Dad, with a... Up to here, recognize us as your children. And 
please give out the proper respect and my the rich soul. Kevin. Yeah, look, Jerry, we've been through this time and time again. You all are us trying to support and we ain't gonna stop until you get me to us. Let me tell you something right now. I just want to see how... <laughs> He's actually pretty convinced. He's pretty good on the mic. <laughs> and, and by the way, and I've I've got it because it was a sight gag, and the people won't get it because it's just audio. But when Dennis Corluzo, bless him, said, and I want to say, Lance Russell, you've got a great tan since the last time I saw you. That wasn't Lance sitting there. It was Corey Macklin, who's an African American gentleman who had taken over the co-announcing spot, and everybody in Memphis at that point probably shit themselves. Because Lance was a local icon, not to be uh, bullied around. But that... <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm going to guess Jerry was booking that summer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a <laughs> I think that was actually the summer that Jerry Jarrett started his construction business and wasn't around much. Uh, and Lawler was definitely booking. And... Oh my God. And, and, and Dennis, you know, <laughs> Dennis was fucking great. That was, it, it, that's like sitting down to dinner with Dennis at, uh, at a restaurant somewhere, except if he was on television as a heel. But anyway, well, I'm sorry to hear about Fred, the elephant boy. May he rest in peace. Well, Jim, let's get away from uh, some sad news. Let's get to some, uh, well, Let's get to some sadder news. Let's get a review out of the way. Did you watch <laughs> AEW Dynamite this past week? Oh, boy, I sure did. Um, the final Dynamite of 2022. Yes, New Year's Smash, was it? Or New Year's Crash, whatever. There were a couple. We're not going to go into minute detail um, because it's been a while, but I wanted to recognize a couple of things, either for positive or negative. Brian Danielson again showed why he's one of the most valuable wrestlers in the world for any company. He got 20 minutes out of the other page and it was good. And I know you say, I'll give Ethan page a chance. Well, I got to be honest with you. I'm not going to give him a fucking chance because we saw where his mental state is about wrestling. When he did the thing in impact with the green screen. And he's one of the, cosplay childish silly fun fucking people in wrestling so i don't particularly give a fuck but fortunately i don't have to turn a blind eye to a future Braun breaker or austin theory because you know besides the fact that he showed me what he thinks about the business mentally there's nothing there to overcome that he's got okay size he's got an eh physique he does eh promos where he tries too hard. He's got one gear. His work is eh. And it's nothing to make me think, oh, God, if only he could channel that power for good. But in this case, he had the best match I've ever seen him have with Danielson because that's what Danielson does. He takes these kids. He not only doesn't let them do anything stupid or nonsensical, or and he... Still does the dives, but they fit where they come, and they don't just look so stupid. And more importantly, he controls the pace, and he knows when to bring it up and down and when to tell these guys, you know, come on or cut me off or do this or whatever. And that's why that people get better when they work with guys who know how to do that. And Danielson just also happens to be one of the darlings of the typical AEW fun and silly crowd he's managed to bridge that gap and and he can be in some cases kind of fun and silly but it fits him in most cases I know they'll do something to prove me wrong but in the ring he does a modern style but he does it with still with legitimate psychology and and perks everything up so I liked this match. I would have liked it if he'd had it with anybody else. And I got to mention, and if MJF being in the skybox, by the way, with the, quote, only hot chick in Colorado, that was a, a nice touch, but 
we just heard him at the start and then he was never did I miss something later in the show or later in the match? We that was it. He was just up there watching that match and then he powdered. I was hoping he would be doing running commentary throughout the show. That would have made it a lot more watchable. Although it was a good episode. But uh man. I like the match. match. I like the match. I think Ethan Page is really good and he has not done anything at the impact level since he has left impact. And Look, desperate people do desperate things. If you're in Impact, you're not there because you want to be there. You're there because you're stuck there, and you have to find a way out. And, you know, I wish he hadn't done that green screen stuff, but I have not seen him do anything like that since. I didn't even see that. I only heard about that because it happened in Impact. Somebody tweeted me 60 seconds of it. It was enough. I have not seen anything else remotely like that ever since. The stuff I have seen, I've really liked. No, they said it wasn't him trying to get out. They said it was his idea. He he complained afterwards they edited it poorly. It would have been so much better, him wrestling himself, if it had been edited right. Well, I don't want to discuss how a filmmaker's yeah. plot was destroyed by editing. You know, who knows what really happened there. Well, maybe one of these days we'll see the director's cut. Really good match. What do you think of the way Stokely's being used? Okay, I was going to mention, first of all, Stokely needs a look, a consistent, important look. He was out there wearing the baseball cap, and I know they worked a spot where he got up on the apron and Danielson knocked his baseball cap off. And he may have had some really stylish slacks on, I'm not sure, but he was wearing a fucking blue pattern collared shirt and a baseball cap and when he was standing on the other side of the rings he only seen from the waist up it looked like a fucking you know an attendant from biloxi mississippi in 1984 had wandered to the ring he i'm not saying he needs to dress in a suit and tie i'm not saying he needs to wear the same thing every time i'm not saying he needs to look stylish because Lord knows I didn't do uh, that either in a stylish fashion or wear the same thing every time. But the, he needs a concept. Who are you? And, and when you dress that way or in that variety of ways, I still know you're important. I still know you look like somebody and it's different or it's eye-catching or consistent. I know who you are. You see what I'm saying? And you know, they're doing manager spots with him. I don't know how long he's been managing or whether he's ever been around, you know, any other managers or whatever the fuck. But there's no heat on it. He doesn't lead an established stable. There's no real heat on him because he does a great promo, but he hadn't really done anything heinous to anybody or anything that anybody really cared about remember i've said if you have an unknown manager you bring into a company you put him with a main event talent and it elevates him if you have an unknown talent you want to be a main event guy you put him with a main event manager but stokely kind of showed up along at the same time as well here's this group of individuals that have been bopping about here to little if any effect for a while and now they're all together and Stokely may be telling him what to do, but it's not really clear because he's out with this guy and that guy, and all of them are basically not really that fucking important. And remember, when he first showed up, after not really being used well in NXT, but still kind of standing out for the limited times we got to see him, he was with Jade. He was the replacement manager for Mark Sterling. Yeah. <laughs> with Jade. And then all of a sudden, he just wasn't with Jade. And every week with Jade, he, I think. If he didn't wear a suit, in my head he did. And then since then, he's been dressing like he's on vacation with Big Bill and the boys. Oh, Big Bill. So, but anyway, this match, Paige and Danielson, they had a great match. Um, and finally, I guess uh, I can say uh, even a blind squirrel finds a nut. Paige had a good match also. He found his nut there. But by the same token, the finish was Danielson slipped the power slam that he'd hit, been hit with a couple of times, hit the stomps and got a cross face and page was already out. He'd already stomped him out. So it kind of, eh, he didn't tap or anything. 
It again, all the finishes just these days come out of nowhere and just kind of bah. There you go. There's no one, two, three, yay! It's all ah, uh, the guy's unconscious. Okay. Well, that's like a oh. Danielson kind of finish, but I really like this match. Let me ask you one question about it, because even though Paige was in it, you seem to at least have enjoyed it a little bit. Did you have any issue with the length of the match? I didn't, because I really liked no, it, but I have it to acknowledge did. it went a while. It was 20 minutes. It didn't drag because it kept moving, and you, did, you didn't see the same shit over and over, but you didn't see 100 things every 30 seconds to make you numb to everything. The match evolved, and Danielson... Obviously, was calling the whole fucking thing. He kept it interesting. The the uh, the break spot because they went through a break. That's when they used Stokely, where he came up and Danielson knocked his hat off and then sidestepped as Page was charging and Page almost hit Stokely, but then Danielson drop kicked Page to the floor and hit a dive and tossed him back in and Stokely distracted him so Page could stop him. So they come back on the other side with heat. But then Danielson's coming back out from... They kept it alive. It was up and down. What did you think of Stokely getting on the apron? Because it was almost like he got in Danielson's face as opposed to the other way around. Well, ag again, they're doing manager spots, but I don't know if they're explaining manager motivation or reaction. Because, again, like you said, he didn't pop up on the apron to either distract the referee or even necessarily to distract his man's opponent come here look at me and then i'll jump down because i'm scared of you he just stood there and went face to face with danielson if i had done that with dusty he would have given me the fucking bionic elbow even and and if it hadn't been called for at that time then he would have been mad at me afterwards that i made him <laughs> give me the bionic elbow and fucked up the finish, potentially, where I was supposed to take another bump, but now I've already taken a bump. Well, now you've taken a bump for you the finish, you fucking idiot. Why did you stand there where I could get you? That kind of thing. But nobody acts like they're scared of the baby faces anymore, managers and valets and whatever the fuck. But that, again, did they tell him, well, get up and distract Danielson, but he doesn't know that, okay, I'm supposed to lure him this way and make him turn his back, but not to face him down. And why did Brian, you one would think that the hat spot was fucking called. Well, I would have thought that maybe Brian would have said, look, when you get up, I'll snatch you. Because now when, when the baby face lays hands on the manager, he's immobilized. Even a hand, he's immobilized. Now you got time. If the manager is in front of the baby face, the baby face doesn't have a hand on him, then the manager should run away, or elsewise the baby face should hit him. Or the manager should be cowering or whatever the fuck, but once the baby face, and, and you can't stay that way long, once the baby face lays a hand on you, now to the people, he's got him. So now I can cower worse and I can shiver and shake because I can't get away, even if he's just holding on to the corner of my jacket. And the baby face has time to look at the people and ball his fist up and say, should I knock this motherfucker out and make sure they're all coming up? And then the guy's coming from behind and the baby face moves in the nick of time and boom, either you hit or you stop short and then the baby face does his thing, blah, blah, blah. But to stand there with nobody with Danielson not holding Stokely, Stokely not being scared, and Danielson not doing anything, but then finally just flipping his hat off, it was kind of odd. He wasn't afraid at all. That was the thing that really no. stood out. Maybe he had a gun in his pocket. I don't know, but he should show it. <laughs> I don't know if he had a gun in his pocket, but... He was just probably glad to see Brian. A promising open to Dynamite. A good match. Well, yeah, well then... <laughs> They followed that up with Wardlow and Samoa Joe, uh, a package on the match, and Wardlow's in the back doing an interview, and he said five words, and then Joe came in with a lead pipe and hit him in the fucking knee and kneecapped him like Kerrigan and fucking Tanya. And this was so, again, so fake. So they went from good quality wrestling to cable access bullshit. And how many... <laughs> Again, how many fights and attacks in the back have we had over the last month on this program alone? Um, what do you think of Wardlow's wardrobe choices? Well, 
He was wearing was, like a sweater, like he was Mister Rogers. It, it was like an alpaca fucking zip up thing of some. Just I don't, I don't know. Maybe is he? Do they still print GQ magazine? I don't know. Maybe he got an endorsement deal. I'm moving through this shit. We'll come back to Wardlow. <laughs> okay. I'm moving through this shit quickly. We'll come back to Wardlow. Believe me, though. Moxley and Claudio against Dante and Darius Martin. Who the fuck are we supposed to cheer for? Top flight. And the baby faces, top flight, attacked the other baby faces, Moxley and Claudio, before the bell. <laughs> but Moxley and Claudio immediately took over and they had a big four way on the floor. And then the baby faces, Moxley and Claudio, started getting heat on the other faces where they rang the bell and beat him up and wouldn't let him get his jacket off. So we're back to AEW again. Again, it's great to beat the heel up, the dastardly heel, and not let him get his jacket. What did these kids do? These wonderful, young, baby-faced, fresh, freckled children. Anyway, at the finish, Claudio knocked one out with elbows and Moxley gave the other one a DDT on the floor. And when he popped up from the DDT, he gave a finger to the camera and mouthed, fuck you for all the lip readers out there. And then Claudio beat the other one flat in the middle with an uppercut forearm. So is, is our Moxley and Claudio going to be heels? Is Moxley going to switch heel and work with Claudio? Are they just going to act like that? <sighs> They're not heels, or uh, I, I don't know. Should we have made Moxley a garbage man and not a plumber? Hey, Steve Austin had an evil boss. What is Moxley so mad at? Nothing. He's uh, Steve Austin didn't get Taka Michinoku in the ring and just kick his teeth out of his mouth. That's the point. It doesn't. <sighs> I like anyway. the match. I actually liked the match. I actually liked it more than most Moxley matches, probably because Claudio was his partner and. You know, most, I shouldn't say most of the time, but I typically like tag team storytelling a little better than singles match storytelling. Not that this was a perfect tag team match or anything, but I like Top Flight. I think they're really good. I'm sure there's a reason why Moxley's well, yes. working with them on TV and beating them on TV. Well, that's a, I, I like them too. So I'm just wondering why two of the, of the other baby faces on the roster beat the shit out of them, knocked one of them completely cold with elbows while the other one got brain damaged by a DDT on the floor. And then, and then Moxley also making sure fuck gets on TBS this week and then just beating them flat in the middle and fucking standing over them. Why to piss in their mouth while they're down there? It, I don't, uh, it was right after okay. this match that I tweeted out. This show has been pretty good so far. Well, then up came the Puddin' Gang and Pockets and Danhausen and Pip and Penelope all together. And if I didn't know that the little fucking sleazeball was from the United Kingdom, I would think the accent is fake because everything else looks fake. <laughs> it's like they're ribbing him now. No wonder he had a box on his head for a year. He's got fucking sky blue hair and a weird accent and he's dressing weird and he's got Penelope pit stop standing next to him with that vacant stare on her face. And with the psychedelic pudding gang now with Danhausen, what the fuck? This was embarrassing. The whole thing was like dress up. If you had a, the TV on mute and you were just watching, you would not instantly go. You would not pro wrestling would probably not even be in your top <laughs> five picks. What is this? It's a horror show. It's some kind of new comedy show on TBS. No, it's Nickelodeon. Know. Or Nickelodeon. Well, you would know you were on TBS if you actually knew what channel you were on, at least. Well, then TBS. Well, look, now they're showing highlights from Nickelodeon on TBS. Hey, you and I have not been a fan of Orange Cassidy since the very beginning. And I've said this a little while ago. I want to know your thoughts right now. Has he ever been colder? For the people that justify his existence in AEW for how much the fans love him and he moves merch and... People dress like him. Does he mean anything right now? What? They're burying him on Rampage anyway. What does that tell you? I'm not... I can't bring myself to mouth the words he ever meant anything anyway. Uh, I you know will what say I mean. that... 
I will say that some of their more faithful fans were blinded by the mass hypnosis and cheered him when he came out. I don't know that he ever sold a ticket or got a, a tenth of a ratings point. I think that's been random chance. But uh, but now, no. It, well, it, how often can you hear Captain Lou Albano's jokes? Hope that shirt's waterproof or... Penis van lesbian! Penis van lesbian. It wasn't funny the first time, really, but, you know, you t but then after that, it's the same thing. It's the same fucking thing. And for all those people, he can really wrestle. No, no, he can't, because we've seen a bunch of him trying now, and he's a self-trained goofball off a trampoline, just like we figured. He hits the ropes more like twinkle toes than a goddamn wrestler. So he can flip around with his hands in his pockets, go to America's Got Talent, sleep in the parking lot, and you'll get 90 seconds to show him that you can do a nip up and a drop kick with your hands in your pockets. But anyway, we got to find out what the deal is, by the way. On, oh, and Hook beat somebody and Stokely's heels came out and we're going to kill him, and Jungle Boy made the save, including Big Bill, who's seven feet seven or whatever. And uh, He's not that big. I don't... Well, he's, he's not going to be he's any not bigger. He's not really big. He's not going to be any bigger than he is right now, either. Uh, it, Yeah. Swerve and Parker Boudreaux and Tatface. We have got to find out what flavor of moron this fucking guy is. He, his entire face is tattooed. He's got the weird hair. That's, I don't think they're fake tattoos either. I think he's obviously either been in a Turkish prison or he's a fucking mental case. But we got to find out what exactly this guy's fucking specific malfunction is. Because I guarantee this is going to be one of those... We'll. We'll see him on TMZ or somewhere in about six months, I guarantee you. Putting a guy that already fucking is obviously mentally short-circuited into that fucking clown show of a wrestling promotion, holy mackerel, something's going to happen. Forget about all that. If we go back to last week's Angle segment, which was an all-time bad one with all-time bad... I don't know if it was a bad script or if these guys were out there doing improv, but it was just not there good was, in any there, way. None of that was written down or prepared, I guarantee you. Well, it was terrible in the most delightful way. What about this being the follow-up a week later? They gave that a whole long segment. It went a <laughs> long time. And we saw this whole thing play out in a really awkward way. And then they get a minute, 90 seconds the next week, nothing else to follow this up to explain anything to make anyone who saw that last week and says, I can't wait to see what happens next week. There has to be one fan out there that saw that was like, oh shit, Rick Ross has a crew. What's going to happen next week? And then nothing happened. No well, follow-up. Well, I wouldn't have done it this way because after last week's segment, I would have barred everybody involved from ever appearing on a television I was responsible for again. However, if they were going to follow it up, standing backstage with Swerve with a kind of a vacant look talking about these two weirdos that obviously can't work we saw that last week and at least boudreaux's got a lot of tattoos but it he didn't cover his cheek and forehead at least yet um he also sells then, his own stuff every time he delivered a blow his whole body yes, was shaking he would, like he yes got he would convulse in in tremors of ecstasy from it or whatever but then it, keith lee's the one they beat up and hospitalized whatever and out comes or in comes, as they're backstage, Wheeler Useless and that whiny voice promo with no real emotion trying to tell of these, my God, it looked like a fucking Boy Scout trying to sell cookies door-to-door -door at a goddamn biker gang. It, so why didn't they just, because <laughs> nobody else has any restraint when he's, Standing there going, well, you guys, why didn't they just fucking smite him? They, he told him off. I, 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 yeah, Claudio and Moxley got rid of him quick. <laughs> they were out there earlier. Where was Yuta? 
Yeah, well, he was getting dirt on Tatface and his fucking bunch. Well, I'm, I'm, but Rick Ross is probably overseeing this from from afar, right? We're not going to see him every week, apparently. So then, did you did you just enjoy the number four thousand seven hundred and twenty six in the best of seven series between the Buckaroos and Twinkle Toes McFinger Bang and the Bermuda Triangle. This they didn't even need the the ring this time because they they don't know what to do what they once they get in it on a normal basis. But this since it was a falls count anywhere match, this was inventive. The match started in the back with a phony six way fight with the corpse referee standing there waving his arms and. It was between four and five minutes before they ever even got to the ring. They started in the back. They did the, again, backstage fights or back of the arena fights or fights in an odd location other than the ring used to lead to huge money when it was done as an angle between main event guys. Then you never saw anything like it in that particular territory or on that program for years before or years afterwards that's why it drew money this is overdone hokey phony bullshit and they don't even try to put any creativity in it and i know some people are going to be so oh, but they're so creative well felix says if i run up the the bleacher seats and flip over backwards can the two of you catch me so i can hurry your rana that's not creativity the creativity of these things is making it look legitimate, making a preposterous thing look somehow posterous, putting stuff there not where they're doing flips and fancy moves in a fight in a building or in an arena or a parking lot or a, gar a garage or whatever the fuck, but to make the shit look good and legitimate and like it could actually happen with things that are sitting around in their natural environment. If you're in a garage, you've got road signs or you've got goddamn a tire or cars or whatever, whatever the case in that environment, whatever's natural, there's where the creativity comes in, trying to make people believe it. And there's none of that from these six nitwits because there's none of that in this company, because there's none of that in this wrestling. They just run each other into walls and stacks of chairs and shit that's sitting there and bounce off of it and attempt to do moves in places where you shouldn't ought to do moves. And then finally they get to the ring and they go to the break. Because what? now that the wrestlers are in the ring, they're not going to have anything to do. So we'll just go to commercial. And it was a six-way the whole time. Uh, you could even see on the on-screen speed search that I was utilizing. Garbage cans, constant fighting on the floor, bunch of goofy bumps, bunch of rotten work for 20 fucking minutes. At the same time as the first match didn't get old, this was the same thing constantly over and over for 20 fucking minutes. And the finish, for those of you who were lucky enough not to see this thing, old Pac had a submission hold on one of his opponents in the ring. I can't remember which one of the buckaroos it was, Cucamonga 1 or Cucamonga 2. But meanwhile, old Harpo Fingerfuck in the back of the arena gave Felix the one-winged fairy off the balcony through tables and covered him there and he was counted out one, two, three. What a fucking mess. Do you have anything else to add or can we move on? You know, I like the previous two weeks matches, although I was high when I watched them. I really didn't like this one at all. Of course, this was the one that got the highest rating in the Observer, which surprised the hell out of me out of all these matches, but... No, I've said good things about the last couple. I did not like this one. Well, you were high before, and after I saw this, I was mighty low. But I'll have you know that 
The, the, well, let's save it because it may be a separate topic because I've heard there's been feedback, but the acclaimed did a rap video mocking and knocking Jay Lethal and Jeff Jarrett. And it, it may have started, so we'll come back on that, right? It's your program. Indeed. So then <laughs> the next match was Anna Jay and Ty Melo Conti against Willow Nightingale and Ruby Soho. And they went a while, and of course, even in the girls' match, they used chairs in the finish. Chairs in the girls' match. So I get now the guys need to use hand grenades. Uh, all right, we were hey. ready for the main event. What, what, what? Anna Jay is one of the best-looking women in all pro wrestling, certainly in AEW. No close-ups. I'm watching this match thinking, let's get a close-up of her. Never. That's your biggest complaint. That was my biggest complaint. Yeah. About this match. I, to, just to not have this inflicted on me, I would have been more than happy to stare close up at Mae Young's face for hours at a time, rather than not have to see this match. But the main event was beckoning us, Brian, in the Booker of the Year's Ultimate Wisdom, Tony Khan has decided that the best way to rehabilitate Wardlow's sagging popularity after they've completely fumbled the ball with his booking and put him in a goddamn angle with miscellaneous fake security guards is to put him in a program with Samoa Joe. And I am not trying to look a gift horse in the mouth because they're pushing Joe. They're giving Joe promo time. They're giving Joe wins on TV. Joe has had a bigger push than almost any other name that has come into this company over the past two years that, you know, debuts to resounding defeats and then is largely forgotten. So they're doing the right thing with Joe. I don't think in a million years I would have dreamed that the great program to have to continue Joe's push and to rehabilitate Wardlow was to put them together. Because it's... <sighs> Wardlow had size going for him, size and power and the ability to overpower and dominate physically his opponents, kind of a Goldberg or a Road Warrior type of appeal, especially in the land of Lilliput that is AEW. When you put him against a guy that's so much heavier and just almost as tall and obviously more experienced and more powerful in the way that he Samoa Joe is more experienced in wrestling, therefore he is able to show his power more because he's developed things that work for him that he does. Wardlow not only can't muscle him around like he could the smaller guys, but now Wardlow, he can uncork those run-up-the-ropes-and-flip type things and the movements that you wouldn't think that a guy that size can do, but that's it, this, this visual and this style of match that they have to have Joe and Wardlow, I don't think is right for Wardlow's strong points. And Joe can do the best job for him. He can and given him whatever, but Wardlow is still green and doesn't really know how to take care of himself. And some of the things you can't tell somebody in a situation where Wardlow, like he was trying to sell the leg through this whole match because the DOA got attacked by the lead pipe at the start or in the promo. And then Joe comes out and says he's got stage fright, he can't wrestle, but here comes Wardlow out and he's limping. And the security's chasing him, but he's going to get in the ring and fight. Okay, that's a great baby face thing. We've talked about that before. But the problem is, they've left him almost 15 minutes for Wardlow, green as he is, has never been put in this position. We're on national television. He's got to sell a bad leg and still keep fighting. And he was working hard, but sometimes he'd fire up and forget to limp. And then he'd lean down and he'd start punching his leg. Brian? I've blown 
two ACLs and torn cartilage numerous times in my knees. Never have I had the, I don't know, urge to punch either one of them. That was Heyman's move against you at the bash. And yeah, well, he couldn't get the right one. But anyway, Joe stayed in control, but Wardlow's inexperienced at selling because he's a big guy and then fighting from underneath and staying alive, but not taken back over. And they gave him a lot of time to do this. And again, you know, finally Wardlow, he's been selling the leg that was attacked with a lead pipe like an hour previously but then Joe has got him where he's going to try to give him the fucking deal off the ropes, but Wardlow ducks underneath him and scoops him up. He stands up under him, and he's got the power bomb, and he fucking power bombs him, and his legs are fine. He's just carried Joe from the turnbuckle to the middle of the ring and power bombed him. Now he gets up and tries a second one, and as he tries to pick him up, he doesn't even get him off the ground, and his leg fucking goes out. So which is it? But then Joe clips the bad knee, gets the rear naked choke, and Wardlow goes to sleep. I guess they oh, he don't want Wardlow to fucking tap. Okay, he'll, I'll just choke him out. Can I jump in real quick here? Yes, please. The booking of Wardlow has been puzzling for a long time. This is not a new thing. And... Earlier in the night when he got kneecapped, it's like, okay, what's this? Maybe they're going to do something where he's going into this title match at a disadvantage. The fans finally get into it, and Wardlow finally wins back his belt. We could repair yeah. him, and it won't hurt Joe. It won't hurt Joe at all. And I think the fans got into it by the end of it, expecting there was going to be a title change. Yes, because all signs pointed to that logically. And they were ready to explode for it. And then this was the finish. Right. And it was puzzling. And I'm trying to think, okay, you know, I don't know how the booker would justify this and killing Wardlow, making him look worse. Just killing him again. Then it went even further. Here we go. So then Wardlow, who went to sleep and lost the match, Joe is up. Joe's celebrating. Wardlow gets up comes back to consciousness, gets up, stands there, looks straight at Joe, and Joe takes the title belt and whacks Wardlow over the head with it and knocks him out. Oh, my God. And he it took didn't a while. do it from behind. It, it, he, just, it didn't, he didn't do it from behind. He didn't do it by... He just... They were looking at each other. And he, oh, here, bam. <clears throat> and now Wardlow's down and knocked out, and this time he's motionless for the rest of the program. And Joe gets out on the floor and he gets the toolbox out from under the ring. And apparently they told him, well, Joe, the scissors are going to be in the toolbox. Well, he takes the tray out of the top of the tool and looks through and he can't find the scissors because the scissors are in the tray. And then he drops the toolbox. He's looking under the ring again. And then finally he picks up the tray and he gets scissors in a toolbox. Ah. I mean, they're listening to the show. We always say, what should be under the ring? A toolbox. I just didn't know you kept scissors and thread and pinking shears and, in the toolbox. But what would you use scissors for on a wrestling ring, Brian? In case the rope is too long when you put it together and you have to cut off a few feet of the top rope. Yeah, you try to cut one of those ropes, whether it's a cable or a rope with a pair of scissors, and get back to me in a couple of years. Anyway, so he takes the scissors out and he rolls in and Wardlow is still motionless and he cuts Wardlow's ponytail off. And the people are going, well, uh, uh. so there's so many things going on here. Yes, you were correct. One scenario is the heel attacks the baby face before the match and kneecaps him to take him out of it but the baby face refuses to give up his chance at the title and he comes out and he wrestles with the bad leg and he wins and overcomes the odds, he gets a huge pop, gets the baby face over, it doesn't hurt to heal because then he can jump on him afterwards. Or you can have the long-awaited match between the heel and the baby face 
and the heel can use the lead pipe or whatever the fuck to fuck the heel and or fuck the baby face in the finish. And then the baby face can fucking maybe even fire back up and bump the heel around, but the heel won. Or you can do combinations of those, but the heel needs to win the match if he's going to get his hair cut off afterwards. Or the baby face. See, I'm so confused now. What has happened here? The heel attacked the baby face with a lead pipe. The baby face wrestled anyway, and the heel beat him clean. He just fucking choked him out. He didn't cheat. And then the heel <laughs> waited for the baby face to get up and look at him, and then knocked him out again. And then the heel cut all the baby face's hair off. Again, why not piss in his mouth while he was down there? Yeah, it's harder. It's harder. How do you even make a baby face look weaker? He got nothing. Well, he got nothing. Well, I'll tell you how. You just show the people exactly how weak he is because then here came Darby Allen and he rolled in the ring and, and hit Joe one shot with a skateboard and Joe took a bump to the floor and ran off with a look of fucking fear and consternation. Thank God Darby was there to save Wardlow. So the other way that you do it is after you have kneecapped the baby face and then beaten him clean in the match and then knocked him out face to face and then cut all his hair off, you send a guy half his size in to fucking beat up the guy that just did all that with one shot. So now Wardlow is Darby Allen's little buddy since Sting is somewhere. Wherever it may be. Yep. Well, that was AEW Dynamite. Yeah. Apparently a new look when we see Dynamite this coming week. I'll tell you what, I would change my name too if I had done that last week. I'd not only, I'd grow a beard, I'd bleach my hair, and I'd change my name. Make sure they can't recognize me after that program. So yeah, we can't wait for a new look. Maybe they'll get a new roster and a new booker. Well, Jim, to make the save, Darby Allen, to save his friend Wardlow from complete and utter humiliation after the total humiliation he had, he came down the entranceway, his music played. What if he had come out of a box? He would have been over, because anybody that comes out of a box gets over, and anything that comes out of a box gets over, ladies and gentlemen. It's just common human nature. It's just, it's... It's as plain as the nose on your face, Matthew, because everybody likes a surprise, right? Everybody likes opening something up. Everybody likes opening up a box. Well, I've had many boxes that I've just enjoyed opening over the years, and I'll tell you what now, folks, you can have your very own once a month if you want it with Box of Awesome from Bespoke Post. Now, is it Bespoke or Bespoke? To what should I accentuate there, Brian? Well, I think it depends on the country and the land you're from. The pronunciation could be different, so I think uh, for this week, for this episode, you're safe. But going forward, we may have some clarification. We may have clarification. Well, nevertheless, don't even worry about Bespoke Post. Worry about BoxOfAwesome.com. Everybody knows how to say that, BoxOfAwesome.com, because what they're doing here, these folks from Bespoke, they are taking hand-curated items from small businesses that you might never have heard of otherwise that are in various places around the country. It, it could be cozy essentials. It could be travel must-haves. It could be cocktail kits. It could be collector's knives. They've got knives. a variety. Yeah. Knives. Every, men like knives, don't they? Oh, I love knives, yeah. Yes. Well, you could even do a funny voice about it before we went on the air. But anyway, <laughs> nevertheless, <laughs> folks, whatever you want, you go to boxofawesome.com and you take a quiz and your answers help them pick the right box of awesome for you filled with awesomeness. And they release new boxes every month and it's across a ton of different categories. That's why you take the quiz. Let's say you're not interested. For example, in... I don't know, phony IDs from Colombia and Peru. 
then you you wouldn't check that. Then you would be pit. safe using bespoke.com or boxofawesome.com because that is not one of the options. They yeah. don't sell phony IDs from Colombia and Peru? Certainly not. Certainly they do not all sell. The, all the phony IDs are from right here in this country. There are no phony American IDs on their made. website. They're all, they don't have any IDs. You cannot buy IDs. That is illegal. You can buy people, but not their identity. Can't you buy can, people. you can own them, but not you can't own their trademarks and their intellectual property. What are you saying? No, you can't. Well, never. If you know, anyway, you you go and you take the quiz at boxofawesome.com. And if there's some people on there that you'd like to put in a box and have sent to you, then you click that or you check that or whatever the case. But the more important thing is each box is valued at around $70, but you pay a fraction of that price because it's awesome. And with each box of awesome, you're also supporting these small businesses because 90% of everything that comes in your box and 90% of everybody that comes in your box of awesome, that is, is from a small up-and-coming brand, of, of, of a small business, a family-owned type of store or type of thing like that. You're supporting the little people out there who are awesome. And it's free to sign up. You can skip a month. You can cancel any time. But you're going to get, I'm telling you, you're going to get tons of boxes, and you're going to love opening them up and seeing the awesomeness that comes out. And all you got to do right now is go to boxofawesome.com and enter the code JCE at checkout, and you'll get 20% off your first monthly box. 20% off a box is not bad. Boxofawesome.com, JCE, 20% off your first box, courtesy of the code JCE. And I mean, they sent some lists of stuff. They've got a box of knives. Holy mackerel. You could be cut long, wide, deep, and repeatedly with these knives. They've So if you're going into hand-to-hand -hand gang warfare, they've got all kinds of tools and Why not do it stylishly, is what you're saying. Why not do it do with it style? Do it stylishly. And, it, and, and uh, this box even comes with hot sauce and barbecue rub in, in with the, the knives. So you can... You can kill the animal, and you can <laughs> rub it with barbecue rub and cook it over an open fire, or you can sauce it up. You can even start the fire using stuff that you get from Box of Awesome. <laughs> yes, well, I heard we didn't start the fire, but it's always burning since the world's been turning. You a Billy but Joel fan? Be... You a Billy Joel fan? Of course. How could you not be a fan of Billy Joel, the Piano Man? You can't get him in this box. But you might be able to buy his identity if you hurry. Boxofawesome.com, code JCE for 20% off your first box of whatever the box may contain. You determine that awesome. based on your preferences. It's all going to be awesome. But the flavor and style and shape and content and materialness of the awesomeness is up to your specifications based on your quiz. They want to give you things you want. Well, we want it all, and let's get all the reviews out I of the way. I want it all. I want it now. Well, speaking of right now, let's right now get out of the way the review of SmackDown, because you and I both watched at least portions of it. You want me to get it out of the way? Okay, hold on. Here we go. Uh, let's get that out of the way. There Is that we go. SmackDown? That's out of the way. That was SmackDown. Wow. No, I can't do that. There was a couple of things on here. Um, it was, of course, SmackDown for December 30th. They had heavily publicized this because the return of John Cena, his first WWE match in the year and last in the year 2022. He only had another 24 hours to get it in. 15,738 in Tampa, and apparently... After Cena was announced, what, two weeks ago, they moved over 5,000 tickets after people found out he was going to be there. So he, maybe, would Brock do that now? If it was a big match, Brock would. No. Maybe? I think. No? I think if Cena did that number in that market, that's probably as good as anyone could do right now in that market. What about in any market? Who sells 5,000 tickets anymore? Just, oh, and by the way, so-and-so is going to be there. Oh, shit. 
We've had the chance to buy these tickets for months, but now we found out one guy's going to be there. We're going to hop on it. Who else anywhere does that now? Punk, Punk did in Chicago. You know, I, I was just reading that, you know, that Mandy Rose got congratulated by that porn platform or whatever. I, I shouldn't say it like that. <laughs> now, but- wait a minute. Now, you, now you've got her. Holy mackerel. She's the star of the Tijuana donkey show now. In no, your mind. no. Come You're- on. Let's not talk Poor- bad about Tijuana. Filthy. Well, let's- filthy. Listen, what I'm saying is that hey, she just those got, donkeys deserve better conditions, too. That's why I donate every year. She just got congratulated by the platform for making over a million dollars before the end of the year. In de- no, in December. Right, but before the end of the year. I should have said for the month. In the month of December, a yes. million dollars. I don't know how many subscribers or super subscribers. I don't know how it works. But if she did a live event right now, just her, I don't don't even know what she would do because it's not even stripping. It's just like, I'll be there and I'll sit in different positions and talk. I don't know what it would be. Could she, you brought up 5,000 people, could someone like that get 5,000 people just to see her? No. No, not a chance. You don't know why? Yeah. Because, well, now, is it a, a live arena event? That's what we were talking about. That's what we're talking about, because we're talking about ticket okay. sales, yeah. Then there's not a chance in hell, no, not a snowball's chance in a hot oven. Now, if it was a pay-per-view event where she uh, tells all of her subscribers, hey, I'm going to sit there in these different positions, and I'll have my little nips under the water, but just barely or whatever the fuck. And you can purchase that in the privacy of your own home. Then she might do that because none of those people want to come to an arena and do what they're doing while they're looking at her shit, while they're sitting in the goddamn freedom hall in Johnson city or whatever next to a bunch of people. You see where I'm going with this? So you think though, it could be a successful pay-per-view. It, it, well, depending on what she advertised and what she delivered, it could be very well be a successful pay-per-view. But I don't think it's something that people want to go out and see in a live forum. Uh, not that they don't want to see that live, but they don't want the other people to see them see it live. The only place they do shit like that's at the Mitchell Brothers in San Francisco. They probably closed that down with the pandemic. I oh. would think that probably wouldn't have flown. Yeah. Plus, one brother killed the other one. That kind of put a damper on things. Well, but it, it, it didn't harm my enjoyment of the place. It was totally none of my business, and I wasn't even there. Did you actually go to the real place? I've, I've, I've been there a couple times. Anyway, so on SmackDown, what they did, we proved that Cena can move 5,000 tickets, and Mandy can move it, or at least put a little blood in it. But nevertheless, um, they start the show with Bray Wyatt and the spooky entrance from behind the green forbidden door. There's the drum solo and the lantern and the cell phone lights in the arena are impressive as fuck. And the people love him and he's got something with the entrance. Again, there's all kinds of something about this guy. And I, and I wrote then, boy, if he ever gets to a point, if he ever makes a point, They did the deal the previous week where he attacked a cameraman. He lost control of himself and attacked a cameraman. And that already damages this whatever he's going to say for me because no, he didn't. No, he fucking didn't. Maybe you can wipe a cameraman out accidentally. They do it in football. That can happen or whatever, but you can't know. You can't do that. And that already makes me not want to believe this. And then he starts doing the the promo in the ring. And we say he can talk. He has a very charismatic speaking style, but you're waiting for the period at the end of the sentence. You're waiting for the point. You're waiting for whatever he's talking about to become clear. Stacy walks through the room. And here's it says he's saying the same thing every time I walk in here. Which is kind of true so finally he apologizes for attacking the cameraman quote in cold blood and then suddenly la Knight's music interrupts yeah 
Something interrupted this. And now, and I don't, I don't know if it's necessarily a positive thing that the heel is mocking Bray Wyatt for the same thing we are. You can't finish a sentence. You never get to the point. You pay some goon to be Captain Howdy. But you're still responsible. That's why he's mad at Bray Wyatt. But that's the truth. That's got to be what everybody's thinking. Isn't it? He never gets to a point. He never says anything. It, it, this whole captain, I don't know. He's always been like this. That's what gets me about people that still like him after his return or people that still wanted him to come back. What is it that you get into because nothing ever happens? This guy never wrestles. When he does wrestle, you'll see. Oh, you'll see. You don't remember. <laughs> I remember. He's not fucking, you know, any, I'm not going to compare him to anyone. <laughs> But he's not good. Right. He's not good in the ring. And then you get all this, and it never goes away. It only gets worse. Well, when L.A. Knight speaks, at least things keep moving along, and you get what's going on. He's a normal human being. And L.A. Knight said, you're a now, fraud. Good. You're a broken-down loser. The rumble is coming up. Well, I'm going to put Bray Wyatt out of his misery. And then when Bray Wyatt bowed up finally and said, you little idiot. Maybe it's time to remind you how cruel I can be when I feel like it and accepts the challenge. That was good. He actually bowed up and responded to something and sounded like, you know, that eh, there's flashes here. But then, as soon as he accepted for the rumble, then we get the screen with the Captain Howdy music and the Captain Howdy video and the clip it you know it's disguised distorted sound revel in what you are embrace the dark now it's fake again because he accepted a challenge that he did supposedly wouldn't have known was coming and then perfectly on cue here comes the howdy music and the entrance of captain howdy and the people are liking it and it takes a while so finally and Captain Howdy gets to ringside, and it's it's so dark you can't really tell who's who and what's what. And he puts his hat on the apron, and he gets in the ring. And L.A. Knight's just stand there watching, and Bray Wyatt stand there watching. And there's a long milk, and then Captain Howdy turns around, and stands next to Bray Wyatt, and there's L.A. Knight. And I'm thinking, okay, the two of him gonna beat, or two of them gonna beat him up, or whatever. And then Captain Howdy turns around and grabs Bray Wyatt and gives him the Sister Abigail move and lays Bray Wyatt out in the middle of the ring. L.A. Knight jumps out confused. And Captain Howdy leaves the ring, gets his hat, puts his hat back on and walks out. And Bray Wyatt is selling. And the people now that were into all this are just like, what, what the fuck? So they, they lost even them. They almost had something here, but I think they ran it off right in the middle. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Again, everyone started thinking it was just Vince that was the problem the last time Bray Wyatt was there with all the stuff like when he drowned Braun Strowman and when he was lit on fire. I think other people and things were lit on fire. There was magic. There was puppets. Mm. And here it is now, and it's back, and it's just in the middle of this show. All of a sudden, this happens. I guess he moves merch, but it goes nowhere. And now they're going to have this match at the pay-per-view, and the pitch black match. <laughs> I, I don't even know. This is not good. They shouldn't have a pitch black match. They ought to have a black bitch match. <laughs> okay. Well, Cody's there. They could bring Brandy in. She could do that promo. Brandy versus Bray Wyatt, I'd totally sign. That'd be the best feud he ever had. That would, it'd be great. It'd be great. All right. So as a tease for later on, Sami Zayn is in the back hugging Paul Heyman and they're talking to each other. Like, and uh, uh, Paul, uh, Paul and Sami are doing the, the, the Jewish references, even though Sami's Syrian, right? But the, the, the interplay between these guys is incredible. But Paul mentions that the crowd chanted Sammy last week while Roman was standing there. That's not really a good looking thing to have happen. And it 
planted that seed in Sammy's mind for later on. And then uh, Seamus versus Solo, that's where Michael Cole mentioned Don West passing, and that was a nice touch. And I, I, again, don't have it. There's nothing wrong with either one of these guys, but eh. Solo, now that Solo is doing the Samoan spike, and he's got his, it used to be the Asiatic spike when Gordy brought it back from Japan. But he's got his whole wrist and hand and thumb taped like a fucking cast. And I don't, Brian, could Ernie Ladd even get the taped thumb over in today's environment? I, Probably not. Because I'm thinking, again, <laughs> And he it did looked, it. It looked pretty and, cheesy at times, even back in the day. Yeah, and 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 but I'm seeing now all these guys are getting up after being hit with zambonis and run over with tanks and thrown off the roof and the thumb to the throat and Seamus is down for the fucking count. I don't know. And then the heels get a, and get in and get heat on him until here comes Drew McIntyre to make a big save, but the th they're kicking the shit out of Sheamus, and they're going to give him another spike while they're holding him. And Drew McIntyre's music plays, and out he comes. He's 200 feet away. If you're robbing a bank, and the money is in your hand, if you hear the police siren on a police car, but it's from a half mile away, do you just drop the money and run out of the building? Or do you complete the crime that you're in the middle of because you got time? Anyway, that's another modern wrestling invention. Go back and look at any footage from days gone by. If somebody's getting the shit kicked out of them, the, the shit kickers are kicking that shit until some son of a bitch gets in the ring and physically stops them from doing it or hits the ring with a bat or a pole or a chair or whatever that caused them to flee for their lives because they've got the job done. They don't stop when the cavalry that's coming for the save is 100 yards away. Anyway, did you see anything with this match that you'd like to notate? Like I said, I didn't see the whole show, and this was part of the show I didn't see. Did you watch Raquel Gonzalez Rodriguez de la Molina Jr. Mascaris versus Ronda Rousey? De Molina Jr. Uh, yes, I yes. did. I watched at least the end of it. She looks great, Raquel, I'm talking about now. And she seems to have improved a lot. And I know because Ronda Rousey's matches have been dog shit awful, right? But this wasn't bad. And Raquel, see, she can show her strength. Like a female Dr. Death, Steve Williams. Doc wasn't the best bench press, but he could show his strength in a wrestling context better than most people. And, you know, Raquel was doing a variety of things, that, and she's got that big, wide back spread. But finally, Rousey had an arm submission on Raquel while and was straddling her shoulders while Raquel was standing on a second turnbuckle. And Raquel fell backwards to try to get Rhonda off, but in the process landed in the arm lock and hurt her arm and hurt herself and tapped out. That wasn't a bad fucking finish. And I'm thinking, well, at least, you know, Rousey has just been not been very rousing lately, but that was wasn't a bad match. And I guess they're gonna keep the belt on Rhonda is what I was thinking, but Raquel's looking good, and all of a sudden music, and here comes Charlotte. As soon as Rhonda had started to talk, and thank God we didn't have to hear much of that. And that was a Charlotte's over. And they didn't know she was gonna be there, so she got the surprise pop and the return pop. And when she gets in the ring, you just look at Charlotte, and then you look, if Ronda Rousey did not have the name and reputation that she had from the MMA world and from the UFC, she wouldn't be on television. Because you get, there's Charlotte's a star, and there's Ronda. And I was the first one to admit that 
Ronda Rousey was a big fucking name when she first started this thing, and she deserved that debut at WrestleMania. But between cooling off and just looking like she doesn't give a shit, and that was where this... <laughs> Charlotte comes out and the people are roaring and they're up and she gets in the ring and they're face to face. And Rhonda not only botches the promo like 30 seconds, it, it was all it was to begin with. And she couldn't get that out, but she threw it away. Just like, ah. And then she didn't get the name of the pay-per-view writer, whatever the fuck. And then, you know, it, it, finally she accepts the challenge that Charlotte makes. and. Charlotte hits her with a big boot to the face, gets a two count, nails Shayna Baszler off the apron, spears Ronda, Ronda rolls through and gets the arm, and Charlotte rolled her up and pulled the tights. One, two, three, just like Flair. New champion, huge pop. Charlotte goes into the crowd to celebrate. The babies go in the air. Hopefully, is this the end of the Rousey experiment? Well, she did return one year ago, because that was the first thought I had. The way this went down, I was like, oh my god, is she done? I don't know if she is or isn't, but she returned one year ago at the Royal Rumble, and it's been a bizarre year for someone who did show so much promise, not just in that first match, but at least at times during that first run. Yeah, and then to come back like, ah, uh, I'm over it. I think that's, I think that's it. She fulfilled her, you know... It's like Tony Khan. He always wanted to be a booker, so he bought himself a company so he could be a booker. Ronda Rousey wanted to be a wrestler until she got a little taste of it and had, you know, and, and she wasn't even a goddamn full-time wrestler, but, you know, the first run, okay, then she goes to have kids and raise goats. And I'm not even kidding, folks. Look it up. And then since she's been back, it's like, I don't really care. I don't, eh, I they're paying me a lot of money. It just That's the vibe. I'm going to ask another question about Rhonda in a second. What do you think of Charlotte as a baby face? Because usually we see her as a heel. Well, I, I, again, timing is everything. Because we missed her because she went away. She did do the angle where Rhonda hurt her to come back. So it makes sense you know, to come back in that fashion. And also, let's face it, a lot of the WWE fans are just going crazy over the returns and the surprise reappearances because not only are these people they wanted to see, but also they went through a long period of time where that show was pretty fucking bland and it still ain't nothing to really write home about. But now Charlotte's back, and this guy's back, and that girl's back, and blah, blah, blah. So they're giving him something. So I, I, I don't see why she would have come back as a heel. If you were Tony Khan, would you consider, if Ronda Rousey was a free agent, doing a deal with her to bring her in? I don't think so. I don't think she'd do it. And if she doesn't want to be in the WWE, I don't think she necessarily would want to be in AEW. And even if he said, oh, I'll give you $10 million and, you know, my my dad will pay you out of his own pocket, whatever the case. Still, she hasn't seemed like she was excited to do this. I don't think she's going to be hurting for money after this little run she's just had. It's a part-time deal anyway. If it's a one-match thing, one match in a series of live appearances to build up the match, to have her lose to someone like Jade, is it worth it? Is she still a big enough name outside of WWE that it would be worth it? Her versus Jade? Goddamn, you know, I'd watch that. That has epic awfulness written all over it. You know, I can't say... Uh, Tony does strange things. So I can't say that he wouldn't do it. I'd, you know, he can make us such a great deal. Listen, I'll hire you. I'll hire any goats you have, whatever you have on the <laughs> farm. I'll put them on the payroll. They can come work here every week. You can, you can have a, 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 an interview segment, Browsy's Acres. Um, <laughs> I mean, it, it's crazy enough. Maybe he will. Yeah, here, Rhonda, $5 million. Just put Jade over in 10 minutes. Why not? She gets reunited with uh, Marina Shafir, right? Oh, well, no, she doesn't know her. She doesn't? Well, that's what Marina said. 
She oh, was well. looking right in the camera, <laughs> told her, you don't know me. All right. All right. Very good. Well played. If you don't know me by now, you will never, ever, ever know me. Ooh. And that was the moment that Philadelphia turned on Jim Cornette right here on the show. <laughs> hey, but the bloodline was in the back because Sammy wants to be on the same page with Roman. And so he brings up the Sammy chant and Heyman's face. He's listening to what Sammy's saying and he's nodding and vaguely smiling. And then suddenly he starts to bring up the chant and Heyman's face registers. And then he starts doing it and Heyman starts cringing inside and curling up into a little, it's classic. And Roman said, no, no. Everybody, you know, you brighten everybody up, right? Bring that tonight. Bring that energy. That's what I want. And uh, apparently Dominic Mysterio got arrested at Rey Mysterio's on Christmas. From what I saw from the clip, they should have arrested Ray's wife because she slapped Rhea Ripley. That's assault. Um... <sighs> I don't know why they, it's the same, it's not as in such bad taste as as the Pillman-Austin gun home invasion thing, but it's still just as phony, and they don't even try to have a plausible reason why the camera is there anymore, just, uh, it, but yeah, and Thanksgiving wasn't good, now Christmas was the shits, I don't know what's going to happen, what happened New Year's, maybe we'll find out that, uh, the fuck it. We're going to have a mixed tag. Rhea and Dominic against Ray and his wife, whatever her name may be. Hey, you know what? It hit me seeing some of this. And I saw the whole video because it was on social media of him and Rhea showing up. Dominic Mysterio may be my most improved wrestler of the year. Do you mean for his wrestling or his nope. speaking and personality? For his personality alone. Although sometimes since he's been healed, I think we've seen him wrestle maybe twice. Yeah. <laughs> he does a good job now being a chicken shit. But in terms of personality, he's great. I hate to put it this way. He's kind of like a better version of Sammy Guevara in, in a sense. I ain't going to argue with you. He, at least he's got the height. Yeah. Would it, be, would it be hilarious if Sammy Guevara's father's like six foot nine? No. Why, why would that be funny? Because there's little Sammy. And meanwhile, Dominic's six foot three and there's Ray. Funny how these things work out. They could work an angle off of that. So, but but him, anyway, but Dominic Mysterio and Rhea Ripley are, I think, pretty good together, actually. Well, have you been peeping in their hotel room window? On camera, on the show, as All personalities right. together, they have done a good job together. As personality, as co-workers, they have interacted in a positive fashion. That's what you're trying to say, That's right? That's what I'm trying to say, yes. Well, I'm not going to let you say it. Thank you. So anyway, uh, Gunther and Brown Strongman were arguing with each other. I, Strowman, I get he's passable as a promo. I just get the big, I don't really understand what I'm doing here because I'm a big fucking meathead vibe off of him. Uh, but he beat up the you know the minions of gunther uh marcel and bartel or whatever he did the phony run around the ring tackle spot where everybody has to bump off of him because he barely touches them and but then gunther put him through the guardrail and beat him up with a chair and got heat on his arm and the referees are all standing around they can't do anything and here comes ricochet and again remember we were talking about in the AEW show, the save was made by the littlest fucking guy, right? Well, this time, at least, the littlest fucking guy brought a chair. And that's why when the heels see the little guy with the chair coming, they bail out, and they leave the guy they're beating up, and they bail out right at the last second. So at least they did that part right here. The heels didn't stop until the baby face got in the ring, and then they scattered. And the babyface brought an equalizer, as we used to call it back when we called finishes in the locker room in the old days, brought the equalizer, the chair. It's just that everybody forgot to tell him what to do with it or how to use it. Did you see this part? 
I don't think so. You know, you didn't see him knock Ricochet out on live or knock Gunther out on live television in front of God and everybody. I did not know. Okay, well, Ricochet bails in with the chair, and the heels powder out through the ropes, jump out, and you know whenever you've seen that down through the history of wrestling for years and years, when the babyface comes in and the heels have all dived out of the ring, the babyface will go after and he'll swing a wild swing over the top rope in their general direction like, why, if I'd have got there a second later, I'd have killed you, right? You've seen it a million times. Well, fucking Ricochet, right into the ring, Gunther jumps through the ropes out on the floor, and Ricochet comes up to the rope, and instead of swinging like sideways or beside of him straight down or what, just swung the chair as hard as he could straight down at Gunther, hit him over the fucking head, busted him wide open. Ooh. And, and, you, and they tried to keep the camera off of him, but it was reported afterwards he sustained a nasty gash, is, I think is what they said. But he fucking dropped and laid there. And then in the little corner of the, before they realized, oh, shit, the man is down on the field. In the corner of the camera shot, you could see, like, one of the doctor, the referee, a couple of other people. Like, Adam Pierce comes out. is like, you okay? And then he was, I guess he was bleeding. They couldn't show that. But... What the fuck? I've he was not only moving, but he didn't make an odd move. He dove out of the ring through the ropes and landed on the floor. And the only possible way that Ricochet could have hit him is if he ran to the rope and just swung the chair straight down at the guy, which is exactly what he did, and knocked him goofier than a pet fucking coon. So what the. Eddie, you heard it. The people fucking popped. And they could see there was no hands up. So chair shots to the head have not been banned in the WWE. You just have to be a fucking blithering simpleton and not know how to use one to deliver one. All righty, are you ready for the main event, Brian? I'm ready. Kevin Owens and John Cena against Roman Reigns and Sami Zayn. And Again, yes, he's a little smaller. Yes, he's not as tan. Yes, he's got a bald spot or starting to. But when Cena, and he's still wearing the same shit he wore when he was 25 years old. But when he comes out with the fire and the excitement and being a star and being who he is, the people go fucking crazy because he's their, one of their last links to when they can think in their mind wrestling was somewhat good and popular. And he stops in front of the camera to thank the fans at home for letting him to do this for 20 years for them. Thank you. Now let's go to work. He's got it. He's got the people. He doesn't have the hardcore smart fans that want to see Felix do 16 flips, but he's got a lot more fucking people in general that want to spend some money and spend some time to see him do his thing. And they brought the bloodline out second because Cena needed to take all the time he wanted, but at the same time, you couldn't leave bloodline standing there. I like the way they did that because a lot of people, oh, yeah, Cena didn't come out last. And as soon as they did the entrances, they went to, to break. So when they came back, they had 14 minutes on the air. So it wasn't going to get old. And basically, you know, they milked, as they should have, Cena getting in the thing for the whole match. At one point, Owens is kicking Sammy's ass, and Roman's not happy. And he asked to tag in, and the fans start chanting for Cena, so Owens turns around to tag Cena in, and Roman blindsides him and kicks the shit out of him. And there was your break spot. And they come back. Owens is fighting back. And he levels Sammy, and Cena was really working the apron, milking that, that, going back to his OVW days. And that's something that guys used to teach as soon as you got, as soon as I got into business, I heard people telling this. If the fucking guy in the ring, the baby face that's selling, 
is going to all that trouble and taking all that abuse to wear his fucking body out to sell, to set up a tag to you, and you're the baby face on the apron, the least you can do in that situation is work the apron and try to look interested in getting the tag and coming and cheering your man on and waiting anxiously, right? And getting the people behind it. So anyway, boom, boom, boom. Roman pulls Cena off the apron and rails him and robs the people of that tag. And then Owen super kicks Sammy, but there's no Cena in the corner. So Owen super kicks and power bombs Sammy again. Two count, Reigns makes a save. Reigns drags Sammy over to the corner to make the tag and then goes for the Superman punch, but Owens ducks it, hits a super kick, nice frog splash, two count. But then Roman hits the Superman, goes for a spear, but misses and goes into the post, and now they've set up the tags. And it was simultaneous tags here. It wasn't a hot tag, but it didn't matter because the place blew because it was John Cena. And all those people know there that they might not ever get to see John Cena get a hot tag again, even if it wasn't a hot tag. Boom, and he makes his comeback. He lays them out side by side. He tags Owens. They do the double five-knuckle shuffle, although I don't think Owens has ever hit the ropes before he does his special kind of five-knuckle shuffle. It was a little off. And then John hit his finish on Roman Reigns but didn't cover him, and Owens stunned Sammy and covered him one, two, three. And that was exactly the finish they needed. Cena looks like a world beater. Owens gets the rub. The baby faces win. Sammy getting beat actually furthers the goddamn bloodline issue, and Roman Reigns emerged unscathed. And the people fucking loved it. That's wrestling. What'd you think, Brian? Fun little match. Nice seeing Cena back on the show. I mean, I'll say the, the truth is the bald spot was a bit distracting, if we're going to be honest. <laughs> you know, after a while with Randy Savage, it was like, okay, you know, part of the problem with the bald spot is all the hair around it. And Cena had like longer hair than usual around it, probably because of his acting stuff. So it really stood out. It stood out a lot. I mean, it was the one thing that made him look like an old man. It was the only thing that made him look like an old man. Not that you can't go bald when you're young. Keeps, ladies and gentlemen. Are they still a sponsor? Keeps, ladies no, and gentlemen. We, we, have, we, haven't, we haven't seen or heard from them in a while. They may not have kept us. But um, it was a good match, you know. The question is, is this it? Is this the one appearance of Cena? Do you get Cena for WrestleMania? What do you do with him? I, I, they better put a full court press on to get the rock at WrestleMania. If they don't do it this year, they might never get a chance to it's Los Angeles, Roman Reigns. It's perfect. Cena's just been here. If they wanted to pull Cena back for WrestleMania for anything, he would have to commit to a couple of different dates because they couldn't just say, okay, he'll be here. They just did this. He'll be here and have the big match. Well, they just did that on network TV, so they can't do the same thing on WrestleMania. He'd have to do at least one or two appearances to set something up. I think they should go full on, try to get The Rock, because it's it may be now or never. It's now or never for Rock to come. They better hurry up. I think people are getting sick of him. Oh, come on now. I'm serious. His last movie didn't do that well, all things considered. The Young Rock How, show... How'd your last movie do there, smartass? I promise you, if I ever put out a movie, it may not make as much money as whatever these fucking dumb movies are that he's making, but I will be a critically acclaimed movie, and the people that go see my movies will be motivated to go make their own movies. Well, and then they'll make more movies about you making your movies. But again, being honest... Which they aren't. And you don't look anything like The Rock either. But again, being honest, his TV show, the ratings apparently are I awful. I might cast you as the best friend. I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't. You wouldn't be anybody's best friend, would you? I'd be okay with executive producer or, <laughs> or something <laughs> at that level. But that's about all the casting I'll be willing to uh, endure. 
Well, that was about all the SmackDown we were willing to endure. That's what it was. There you go. All right. Well, there you go. And that was SmackDown, a show that uh, typically sucks. Where the hell's this fucking timer here? There, no, I hit the wrong thing. Here it is. SmackDown, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> it makes you lose your timer. But let's move on with the show, Jim. Lots of things happening during our break. I will ask you about this only because we've actually received emails about it, so it became a popular topic. Did you see Chris Jericho attempting to <laughs> pick a fight with me on Twitter the other day? Yeah, over the Christmas holidays. Well, I guess they don't celebrate Christmas in Canada, do they? I he's believe not... they do. I believe they do celebrate they? it worldwide, yes. Do they celebrate in Canada? Do they ever smile up there? Depends but on the it, province. Well, that's true. It, it's very provincial. But it, it, over Christmas week, when one would think that he would be cavorting with his loved ones, instead he's maligning you on Twitter, and not even maligning you directly on Twitter, but maligning you while maligning another fan out there in the, the Twitterverse who had taken issue with him in some kind of fashion. And he didn't say anything about you. Didn't say anything about me. <laughs> I wasn't even there. Thought he could get, maybe thought he could slip one by uh, with, without uh, getting the cult on him. But what uh, I've lost it again. Ratioed is what it is. What the kids call basically your, your response to his smart aleck comment got more likes than his original statement twice so he got he got slapped back by twitter on christmas week for opening his yap to begin with the chain of events was really funny we're not going to go into this whole story right now because i'm not mentally there yet but i was sick <laughs> for about a day and a half you had some issues for about a day and a half. And I was in bed, and I'm never in bed. I'm always working. So I was in bed resting, and I finally get the energy to sit up. I'm like, oh, let me see what's going on on my phone, because I have all these notifications. <laughs> and I see that Jericho, who last I knew had blocked me for probably very good reason, just if he doesn't like my yeah. opinions on shit, and he doesn't want to see these videos pop up, good idea. He unblocked me, apparently, and he tagged me with some other guy. You and Great Brian Last have figured out my evil plan. I can't wait to bury Stark Man Jones, or Ricky Starks, Action Andretti, Jungle Boy, Darby Allen, Sting, and every other young talent in AEW. So I can achieve my goal of killing the company, killing all in caps, Russo style. But don't tell anybody, dot dot dot, it's our little secret. We know he's kind of like his boy uh, Trump. He says the crooked shit he's actually going to do out in public so he can claim when he does the crooked shit that he's just joking about it. Yeah, now he's going to think, if I do a job for Ricky Starks, I've shut everyone up. Nope, that's not the way it works. So again, I'm like, what the fuck's this guy all of a sudden tagging me? I thought we were, we had an agreement. You blocked me, and I don't give a fuck what you think. So it worked out really well. It's kind of like mind over matter. You don't mind it, he don't matter. I guess that's exactly what it is, but I replied from my sick bed, having to deal with this kind of drama. Look at the confidence one gets from a special relationship with Mega and a contract guaranteed by Tony's dad. There's no more self-serving wrestler than Jericho. He latches on to people with buzz, and by the end, their buzz is gone. Now, let me also say, I just made an edit. I was sick. So I put, there's no more self-serving wrestling than Jericho instead of wrestler. And I'm terribly <laughs> embarrassed by that. That would not happen if I could have edited. You were tweet. under the weather. I was under the weather. But I'm thinking, what the fuck's this guy want to pick a fight with me? That's not going to work out well. It doesn't work out well for people. And coincidentally, we were about to get on the bus with him anyway. Well, he didn't know that yet. So he tweeted back at me. And he said, once again, you nailed it. Great. One by one, I shall kill the buzz of every wrestler in AEW, and I won't quit until I'm finished, and I refuse to do jobs, too. All shall fall, in caps, to the company killer. I'll have to call Mega to get that copy written. Now, let me stop right there for a second, because I told you this. I kicked myself off air for not responding. 
Company killer is so lame. It's so Jericho. Company insurrection, as people believe. Yes. I'm an insurrectionist, and I'm here to infiltrate AEW and take it down and make it my own. People will believe that. So fuck company killer. That's one of your usual dumb ideas. The company insurrectionist, the elite insurrectionist. He's he stumbled on it. He stumbled on a, a tremendous gimmick. Just got to get that trademarked. He's got a lot of shit in caps. So my final response, which seemed to have shut him up, was, is this for your new wrestle crap column? Seriously, be less concerned with your favorite podcaster saying it and more concerned about the locker room knowing it and believing it. You have star power, but a track record of the worst ideas and taking care of only yourself. And he knows that's the fucking truth. And everyone else does too. So that was the last I heard. Now what he did... Either that or he, he passed out before that tweet came out. There's a very good he chance He woke of up that. the next morning and he didn't remember exactly what was happening. Now what he also didn't know, and no one else did except for Jay Sharknado, we were preparing a Chris Jericho omnibus. Now we've been asked about one for a long time. And the original idea was all of his bad segments in AEW... And we realized if we tried to do that, it would be probably in the range of 26 hours. So we weren't ready for that right now. There's been a lot of bad shit. So we did the mind of Jericho. All the dumb comments, all the dumb thoughts, all the dumb interviews, everything he has said that we've talked about. Outside of matches. Just out out in public, loose and wandering around. And it's been a big hit. People really like it. So check it out. It's on the official Jim Cornette YouTube channel. And it's, of course in the drive through feed, wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And we have uh, also buses on uh, everybody's favorite funniest moments and guess the program and a commercial on the bus and a variety of other things out there right now on either YouTube and or the podcast feeds. That's right. And there's a couple more coming and uh, they may be exclusive to one or the other. So check everything out, subscribe to everything. The castle cornet one is taking a lot of work, but the, uh, the search for the origin story of the Monroe brothers is on right now. <laughs> we'll let everyone know how that turns out. Well, I can, you got to you gotta go back to probably 2019. They've been around for a while. Do you remember what month you hired them? I, I, actually, they were here in 2018 briefly, and then they made an impression on me, and so I, I started them to work uh, full-time the next year. So what do you think about Jericho trying to pick a fight with me? Well, I don't know what, again... You know, it's like this fucking idiot McCarthy that just got voted down to not be the Speaker of the House because even his own friends don't like him. Don't pick a fight in, in out of nowhere for no reason out of the blue unless you're pretty sure you're going to win it. And he didn't win that fight with you because more people liked his your tweet than liked his tweet. So therefore, he got voted down on his issue with you. Apparently, more people believe what you say than what he says. So if I was him, I would have waited till I found one that I could win. All right. Well, that was the uh, Chris Jericho is a douchebag segment this week. Or as we call it here, the beginning of Omnibus Volume 2. Actually, I was going to say, I thought you were going to say, or as we call it here, another week. Jim, another story. I've seen a little bit of this. It feels like everyone's working with each other, but who knows? Karen Angle getting mad at the acclaimed and this leading to uh, just a news dump of infidelity from Karen Angle or Karen Jarrett. Have you been following this? Well, I apparently not closely enough to understand it. And now we, we talked about when we were mentioning the AEW show uh, a little earlier in the program that the acclaimed did a, another rap video parodying Jay lethal and Jeff Jarrett. And there were a lot of, biting and incisive comments directed at Lethal and Jarrett in a mocking fashion, insulting fashion. But one of them was there. Oh, God damn it. I think I, I still have. Hold on. Wait a minute. I jotted this down. I'm looking for my notes. The quote. You jotted what? Some, that a tweet? I, no, I jotted down the quote from the. From the video. And you stealing money like it's Kurt Angle's wife talking about Jeff Jarrett. And, you know, that's a little, ooh, personal thing there. People know there's some history there. 
And, you know, it's in the context of the rap video and everything. But then, apparently, Karen tweeted in response to it or or was allegedly ticked off or whatever. But then other, somehow other women and Kurt Angle have got involved in this. And I, or at least have been mentioned in this. And I lost track on the left turn at how all of a sudden Karen... Jarrett being mad at Max Caster for mentioning her in a rap about Jeff Jarrett has suddenly Kelly Kelly, the old WWF girls involved and somebody else. I have. So I, I don't know where, where this left turn into all these other people took place. Hold on for the first time ever. I'm going to the Karen Jarrett Twitter account. Now I love, I like Karen. I've always enjoyed my, conversations and interaction with Karen don't have a bad thing to say about it. Otherwise, and she almost broke my back the last time we actually did a spot in Illinois about seven years ago. And again, her husband's Jeff Jarrett and she does business with a lot of, or he does business with a lot of desperate people. So you never know how much of this. Hey, come on how now. Much this isn't no, let's be honest. All of a sudden she tweeted out the other day, I guess I can't find the original one, but we can start here. My marriage to Kurt, was over long before Jeff and I started seeing each other. We were legally separated at the time Kurt signed with TNA, living in different homes. We got back together, and I tried to get over the affairs, among other things, that went on in our marriage, but obviously wasn't able. So far, a pretty reasonable... See, I did not, I, I did not, I didn't ask them when they showed up in TNA, and, and Karen was... Uh, on camera and doing stuff, I didn't know they had been separated to that point because I don't ask people about their personal business, but this is news to me. Funny and sad how all of that has been swept under the rug over all these years. Jeff didn't steal me from anyone. Hashtag Don Marie. Hashtag Whoa! Kelly Kelly. Wait. Hashtag Deanne Seiden. Who? To name a few. That's the woman who got arrested for stalking Kurt Angle. After they had an affair. Okay, I didn't know this happened. So, yeah. uh, goddamn, how long have you been covering the angle beat? You're up on all the information. No, I just read that because now everyone's interested in what's going on. People love train wrecks. I mean, it, wrestling's no different than real life. People love train wrecks. So, it's sad. People are hoping this is real and it's not a work. This isn't leading to some Jeff Jarrett, Kurt Angle. Well, I'm not battle for Karen or whatever. <laughs> well, see, it could have been a work if if Karen was mad at Max Caster and came out and slapped him in the face. Then that, but now all these other people are getting involved, and I'm I'm wondering at this point maybe they struck a nerve with Karen, and Jeff wasn't home yet, so she couldn't say to him, "Hey, what in the hell are they saying?" And and there you go. Who knows? She's got a great personality. She was a natural for the fucking wrestling business. Between the promos the, and the fucking expressions and the fucking whole nine yards. Well, Barbie Blank, the former Kelly Kelly, quote tweeted and, that. And by the way, how, which one would you pick to be her real name if you didn't know? This girl has two names, Kelly Kelly or Barbie Blank. I wouldn't know what to think was her real name. Why wouldn't, let's stop for a second here. I mean, we should have had this conversation 15 years ago, but we weren't doing the show. If you hire a blonde young model and her real name is Barbie Blank, why would you change that? Why wouldn't you run with that and go all the way? That's a perfect name. <sighs> Mickey Mantle. Barbie <clears throat> Blank. Kelly Kelly. Kelly Kelly. Well, here's Kelly Kelly's response. Kelly Kelly should have been brought in as, as Kevin Kelly's sister. Then it would have had to, well, she came in after Kevin was gone. They would have had to have brought him back as her older brother. I'm sure he was probably available. Well, here's what she said before you fantasy book the rest of this crap. I keep linked in this tweet. I have DM'd Karen Jarrett to privately ask her, and I'm waiting for her response. But I want to go ahead and publicly make a statement that oh, while I'm waiting for a response from this personal issue, I'll just tell everybody on Twitter what I think. The only way I can be linked to Kurt is we were co-workers. Sorry, but thanks for the Monday morning entertainment. Laugh out loud. 
So a denial there. A denial from Kelly Kelly. Do you think that Kurt had told Karen that he was messing around with Kelly Kelly to throw her off the scent of who he was really messing around with? Well, one of these other names is, well, maybe more than one of these other names out here may have been somebody he was actually messing around with. So I don't know if that worked. Hello. Well. <laughs> You know, actually, <laughs> there was a deal like that in OVW one time, and I can't remember the exact story that was being told, and I know the people that were involved, but I won't mention those names anyway, but one of the fucking guys was so excited to reveal gossip about who was fucking around on who that he goddamn ended up fucking starting to tell one of the people that he was, the story was about and had to fucking oh change it <laughs> on the fly to other people, which then that person went and repeated that story to somebody else, but with other people in it named who then heard about that. And was, there was something actually going on, which then was out it. And it was a whole goddamn big deal. You never know about these things. So what do you think? Do you think this is You a, should stay away from gossip. That's what I think. Well, do stay you think this is a work? I mean, it's out on Twitter. It's out in public. That's the thing. I agree. If you're going to have any of these issues for real, why broadcast actually, them? Well, actually, I would have thought, if, again, if she was mad at Caster or the Acclaimed or we got something with, I don't know, AEW talent, then I would have thought it was a work. But now that I'm hearing that it, no, I... I I, and also, if Jeff Jarrett's involved, he would have booked a better angle. No pun intended. So I'm thinking this might not be a work. I'm thinking this might be a, a raw nerve that was struck somewhere. We'll see. There's a lot of people who need money. We'll see what happens. But let's move on here. You know, speaking of weird people, let's go to the out of wrestling, doesn't have a name segment here this week. Jim, have you been following the trials and tribulations of George Santos? George Santos. George the Animal Santos. The, the liar and prevaricator that has just recently been elected to the House of Representatives on the Republican side. And they have found out, ladies and gentlemen, for our international audience, this guy got elected to the House of Representatives. He's a Republican. And they found out that since he's been elected, he has completely lied about everything in his life, his educational background, where he's worked, where he is, and the money he had is suddenly, somehow he was penniless a few years ago, but then he came into some money, but none of the employers that he has said he worked for have ever heard of him. None of the colleges or schools he's gone, said he's gone to have ever heard of him. He's got an arrest warrant out in Brazil for fraud. Um, I mean, you know, it's it's a and, and daily. Other people are coming out to say, no, this fucking guy is a crook and a liar, and here's why. An ex-boyfriend of his just came out and said, fuck, he convinced me he was going to take me to Hawaii, but the plane tickets were fake. And then he stole some money from me and then blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and, 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 and I was like, what the fuck? So they're, they're actually. That's a lot of work. Still, not just not giving them tickets, but fake tickets. Fake tickets. And, and it was, they were living together. And the guy who said, I called my father, come and get me. And I got away from him. He's crazy. They're still talking about seating him because to be kicked out of Congress, two-thirds of the Republicans would have to vote to say, no, you don't deserve to be here. And because of their slim majority that they just won, and that's still going to be a problem, because they don't want to lose any votes. So they're going to keep a fucking liar and a con man and a shyster that it currently has an arrest warrant out for him in a foreign country for fraud just because of his, wait a minute, I've just described the reason why they keep every other goddamn Republican that's been elected, from Lauren Bubert to Marjorie Treason Green to 
Jim Kitty Diddler Jordan and the rest of them. Well, he didn't diddle the kitties. He just laughed. I'm about sorry. It. He just knew. He about just the laughed the about it and told jokes about, about it. it. Yeah. But this happened on Long Island, so this is all on the local news up here. And even the Republicans are like, "Yo, this guy has a lot of problems. He maybe he shouldn't be going." Like even the Republicans have turned on him because he made up a whole family story about the Holocaust. Complete bullshit. Called himself Jewish multiple times. Complete bullshit. Made up a story, apparently, that his mom died because of 9-11. Oh, yeah, I saw that! And then it turned out she actually died in 2016. And then you're thinking, like, oh, well, you know, maybe she was down at ground zero. He claimed that she was, like, the first female financial executive. Then other people were like, no, she was a cook. She didn't do any of these things. So well, that whole story see, was made up. Did you see the two screenshots of the tweets where he tweeted just a couple of years ago or maybe, no, he tweeted recently, yes, as a person who lost my mother in 9-11, blah, blah, blah. And then they dug up a tweet of his from, like you said, five or six years ago, and my mother just died today of something. And they said, when you lose your mother once, it's devastating. But when you lose your mother twice, it's just <laughs> careless. It's just careless. And so... <clears throat> There aren't that many stories you hear about with this much notoriety where the person just appears to be a complete con artist. There's nothing that points to anything other than their entire existence is bullshit. And well, and here's something everybody say, you never criticize the Democrats. I'm going to hear. He ran a race and the opponent never figured this out. Nobody ever checked, fact checked anything he said about his background or his life. Aren't they supposed to do opposition research, figure out yeah. what's wrong with the guy you're running against? Well, wouldn't that, my God, Stephen P. New could run a background check in 10 minutes. It would have discovered he didn't go to goddamn Harvard or wherever. Stephen P. New should move to Nassau County. That's the problem. The Nassau County Democrats have bad leadership. So he'd get a lot of work up exposed there. Exposed like yeah. this. But no, so uh, I can't imagine why and the people in new york from what i've seen on the news are up in arms about this that they don't want him representing them so certainly the republicans for no other reason than the public relations which is probably the only thing they're worried about have to fucking kick this guy out and say no but then they'll probably lose the seat because who's going to vote for another republican after they just got conned the first time in that district. And it's Long Island. You never know. I, that's we'll, the truth. That's the truth. It's Long Island. You don't know. Another Republican could come right in and win that seat still. We will keep the listeners apprised on whether George Santos is coming to town. Do you think George Santos would be a good wrestling manager if all this politics stuff doesn't work out for him? No, actually, I don't because he, he's not a very good liar because he got caught. Trump had already been around for fucking three or four years before they fucking uncovered everything that he had lied about, even though it was obvious on the face of it. This guy got caught before he even got seated. However, let's look on the other way. Let's try to make it so that maybe you could be a little sympathetic to old George here. What if in 1986 someone discovered that the Cornets really didn't have a yacht? They really didn't have servants. They really didn't have a fleet of cars, a jet, whatever. Mama Cornette was funding in a mansion in Louisville, <laughs> a veranda. Yes, they didn't have all these things. Wait a minute. We had a veranda. We had a veranda. We had, we had, as a matter of fact, we not only had a veranda, we had rights to have a veranda. We had our veranda rights. <laughs> but what if you, but you know exposed... what we didn't have? What's we that? didn't have a lawyer to sue a motherfucker. That's what we didn't have. Yes, folks, when we get back in a swing of things for the brand new year, we'll have all kinds of great transitions. But until then, we're just going to blurt these things out. Hey, you want to sue a motherfucker and make his life miserable because he's fucked you around in some kind of way? Well, let me tell you what. <laughs> there is no better place to spend your money or to place your trust 
than Stephen P. New at newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084, because he's a heartless bastard, he's cruel as the day is long, and he will make the person who has made you unhappy suffer the pits of eternal damnation in hell. Ha! By the time he gets finished with them. Ha! That's what Stephen P. As a matter of fact, he was just headed over the other day to go over there to the to the Capitol in Charleston, West Virginia, and snatch that Governor Justice up by the chin and slap him around a bit. Well, no, it was a negotiation. It was a very respectful and professional negotiation. There'll be no slapping around of the governor. Well, I'll have you Except know Except metaphorically he, from Stephen P. New. Stephen P. New had his cell phone on in his pocket while he was doing it, and I'll tell you, the conversation went like this. Hey, Governor, it's a nice state you got here. It'd be a pity if something happened to it. But huh. you've been fucking my clients around, so i tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you the opportunity right now to pay up, or elsewise, things are going to get tough for you. Stephen P. Coraluzzo. And then I heard that. Yeah. That's right. Stephen P. Coraluzzo knew, and he told old Governor Justice the way it was going to be, <laughs> and that's what happened. And he's going to do the same thing down there in Louisiana, too. Huey P. Kingfish Long, your days as governor of Louisiana are numbered. Because Stephen P. New is coming to Louisiana to take care of that off-brand ragtag shade tree energy company that y'all got down there. The energy company down there, when they got hit with the Hurricane Katrina, you know, the big one, the big one where old Kanye outed George Bush for not liking black people. They got hit by that hurricane down there, and it wiped out all the power and the infrastructure, and the energy company went to the federal government of the United States of God America and said, if you'll give us millions of dollars, then we'll fix this, and that'll never happen again. And they got that millions of dollars, and guess what happened? They didn't fix it, and it happened again. They gave all the big wigs in the company big million-dollar bonuses and didn't fix shit on their infrastructure, and the next hurricane came along, and everybody was out whistling Dixie through their ass because they had nothing to fucking plug into and no power and no oxygen machines and no fucking air conditioning and no heat, and the little babies were in the streets, broke and penniless with bugs and vermin crawling all over them. Well, if your kids are laying in the street with bugs and vermin crawling all over them, there's only one person that you need to call, and that's Stephen P. New, because he'll get even. He may not pick the bugs and the vermin off of those kids, because he don't like him any bugs and vermin, but he will get to the root of the matter of how the bugs and vermin got on those kids, and he'll make the people pay for it. Newlawoffice.com, 888-692-8084. Do you have any bugs or vermin you'd like taken care of, Brian Last? No, we don't have that kind of issue up here, and no one else should. And maybe before you call Stephen P. New, call Health Services or Child Protective Services, depending on what you see or what you're a part of. Well, it doesn't have to be a child. It could be an adult with bugs and vermin on them. But if somebody's put bugs and vermin on somebody you care about, call Stephen P. New. He'll get the bugs and vermin off. Well, that's right. Stephen P. New... A friend of the show and a friend of all the listeners, the consigliere of the cult of Cornette, but Jim... He's an enemy of rats and vermin. That's right. But, <laughs> but Jim, let me ask you about something that has been sent in by several people. Let me try to sum things up. Dax Harwood recently made some comments about AEW, about the issues with CM Punk. He said positive things about CM Punk. He encouraged the EVPs to find a way to get past everything so everyone could work together. Word has now gotten out that, through Dave Meltzer, that there are people upset in the locker room. The about pipeline! These... The pipeline! People are upset about this. What are your thoughts? Well, again, do you have the comments that he made because there was nothing inflammatory? He said, hey, he said Punk was a a big star and brought a bunch of eyeballs to our show and was you know kind and easy to work with in his experience and he wishes that everybody could get on the same page somehow for business and all get back together whether or not that's possible or whether or not any of those people want to do that or not that's beside the fact he didn't say anything 
in fact, he didn't say anything near what we've said. He didn't say anything near what he could say. If he wanted to be honest about his treatment and the treatment of other people in AEW, he could have really lit some asses on fire. He's still playing nice. That's the thing a lot of people don't get. But, you know, but what he said was not inflammatory at all. Hey, that's actually, if I was the boss of the company, if I was Tony Khan, and any wrestler said to me, well, what do I say in public when questioned about this issue? Say, well, boy, it'd be great if everybody could sit down and work out their differences and get along and come back and make money. That would be the thing that I would want you to say. So that's what he said. And now, according to Uncle Dave, some of the people in the locker room are upset about that. I wonder who those people would be. Could it be Mr. Jericho, who it's pretty public now that he went to Tony Khan and said, CM Punk is a cancer and should never be in this company again, and I'll do anything to stop him from coming back, and he's told the boys that. Because he's the one one of the ones getting that out because it benefits his position if Punk is not there and it benefits his position if he's on the side of all of the EVPs. But there was nothing inflammatory in Dax Harwood's comments whatsoever. They, a bunch of people got on him week before last, I guess, because he said, hey, if Jim Cornette has an opinion, he's earned the right to give it because he's been in this business 40 years and excelled at everything. Well, that's actually maybe a little more inflammatory than talking about punk, but not much because it's still true. Just like what he said there. It'd be nice if everybody could work it out. They won't, but it'd be nice if they could. So, again, what kind of mind control big brother environment are they fostering over there when you can't even make a nice professional remark in public about people that you work with or you get half the locker room pissed off at you but if you get on twitter and cut promos on each other for a shoot not working or get in a fight for real not one of the five fake ones they have every week back in the locker room. Well, that's okay. Because apparently that's okay because nothing bad ever happens from it. I, where's Andre? He's home getting a check because he punched Sammy in the face. So <laughs> After being told, Maybe. even if you do that, you won't be fired. Yeah, we ain't going to fire you. Well, that was, that was like here. Let me hold your coat while you punch this motherfucker in the face. They actually said to him, we're not going to fire you because we know that's what you want. So you can go back to the WWE. So we're not going to fire you. We're going to send you home, but we got to keep paying you. I don't get that. Don't... Can we just stop there? I yes. don't understand that at all. If you have a guy who doesn't want to be working for you, that you're paying more money than he's probably worth in the United States right now. And he doesn't want to be there. It's not going to hurt you for him not to be there. You just won't be paying him. It won't make you look bad when he shows up somewhere else. You kind of see what his ceiling is. No difference to your business whatsoever, whether he's there, whether he's in WWE, whether he vanishes off the face of the earth. Not one dime difference in your bottom line. I get not wanting to... I shouldn't even say not wanting it to be. Not wanting it to appear like WWE is getting one up on you. But fuck it, just cut him. Let him go. Well, but the point is, you well, can't I don't be professional that... in public. Yeah. Okay. But you you can you can't you can't be professional in public. You can instigate backstage fights. The EVPs can get involved in them. You can punch people in the face. You can knock them on Twitter. You can call people motherfuckers on TV on national cable, whatever. But heavens to Murgatroyd. Do not be professional and make a comment like, can't we all just get along? Or elsewise, the goddamn half of the locker room that is preventing the company from being anything bigger than what it is or ever will be because of them will crucify you and tell Uncle Dave you're a, a bad person because you don't like their fucking group of friends. Well, you got to remember, too, we've now seen several comments recently. This whole idea that 
people were going around. The way it was put, it was almost like, we promise you we will not let CM Punk come back. Like, they're protecting people from CM Punk. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the idea, we've now seen comments from, I think, Ricky Starks, obviously FTR, maybe Hobbs at one point. Hobbs, Hobbs was complimentary at one point. I think Stokely just said something. You know, he couldn't really say too much, and he's a low man on the totem pole there right now. The gun boys were happy with him at one point, weren't they? Seem to recall. Maybe I'm mistaken there. Yeah, so in terms of who would be upset, first of all, who would be going around promising they could protect anyone other than someone who's above or in a certain position? So yeah, Jericho doesn't want him there. He never wanted him there, and he certainly couldn't wait for the repercussions to come out of that fight because he didn't want CM Punk there. The Bucks and Omega, they, they don't want Punk there, and if Punk was ever there again, they're probably not going to work with him. The friends that they, that they have in their locker room, you think Jungle Boy wants CM Punk there? <laughs> he wants to play with his friends. So yeah, Adam Page? No, I'm pretty sure Adam Page doesn't want CM Punk there. Do I mention Colt Cabana? He's still there. You know, there are certain people I'm sure don't want CM Punk there, but at this point, there's been a bunch of people who have said, he was nice, he worked with me, he helped me, gave me suggestions. Dressing room door was always open, gave everybody Starbucks gift cards. How much, you think? Like 25, 50? What do you give as a gift? And that's I, I think it I think it was like hundreds of dollars I heard on each one for and each one a group of people. Hold on, he was giving out Starbucks gift cards worth hundreds of dollars each. That's I believe the story that I was told was that whoever who was in the pinnacle at that point, everybody got hundreds of dollars of Starbucks cards. Oh no, I heard he gave Starbucks cards to all the girls. Well, he did. I think he's a big Starbucks fan. Because he did that, too. It was another Me, too, story. but buy your own fucking drink. What? That's a very <laughs> nice guy right there. That's the point. That's the point. It's so it's bit. like, it's almost like a complete split. There are the guys, for one reason or another, for one agenda or another, who don't want Punk there, even though he's still... I saw uh, PWTs put out their biggest merch sellers of the year. I had actually heard that for AEW alone, Punk is still the biggest merch seller. They had Danhausen as one and Punk, too. Either the biggest merch mover or the second biggest merch mover after the comedy character. And then there's another half of the locker room that appreciated him. Probably would have been working with him. So it's... Well, think, think about this, though. It's not as cut and dry as a lot of people want to pretend it is. The story from the trampoline gang side of things was that, oh, everything was harmonious in the locker room and everybody was happy until he came around. Think about this. When they started the company, it was all of the EVPs, hand-picked friends, and every freak of nature on the indies that somebody had ever laughed at for 15 minutes, and Chris Jericho, and he was more than willing to throw his lot in with the cool kids. But he was the only real name. And everybody was happy, because it was a... <laughs> It was like a little treehouse, a little group of friends that they had handpicked. Couldn't draw a goddamn dime. Couldn't draw money with paper and green crayons. Couldn't draw any money if you dipped them in glue and drug them through Fort Knox. I could go on. But they were happy. And then the company actually starts getting stars and recognized talent from other places. And people that the fans knew who the fuck they were and might be interested in seeing them, and they rated NXT and a blah, blah, blah. Of course, they botched most, if not all, of those debuts and pushes, but nevertheless, a new group came in that wasn't hand-picked and vetted by the EVPs, and they just happened, in a lot of cases, to have more talent than the group of ragtag indie misfits that had started the thing. At least they had all of their appendages, two arms, two legs, things of that nature. And Punk was the one that moved the needle for him the most. And Punk was also the antithesis of the kind of wrestling that they want to do. Meaningless, goofy flips and twists and turns with their tongue in their cheek the whole time, winking at you that they're not serious. And Punk was the exact opposite of that. And Punk's also a guy that doesn't sit on his feelings or just sit at home and eat muffins and bury his 
frustrations when nobody is paying attention to what he's saying. And so there you had a chemical recipe for disaster. And now, it, it just like but even before he was gone, but now especially that he's gone, they've got to slander him, and they've got to make sure that everybody thinks that they were the baby faces, or elsewise they come out looking like the goddamn self-righteous, self-absorbed, egotistical fucking twats that they are. Jim, this one sent in the corny drive through at gmail.com from James. Mike Pappas recently passed away. Pappas. Pappas. I do that every time. What are Jim's memories of Mike Pappas and his wrestling career? Boy, I, t I actually got to see Mike Pappas uh, live in person a number of times. He was here in, in the Tennessee Territory in 76. I saw him at the Gardens. He had been here before and I'd seen him on television. You know, he was, he was an exciting underneath preliminary baby face. And I know that everybody now I've just completely lost them because they're like, what, what, what do you mean? He was only like five foot four. And even though he was, he was five, four, he was stocky. They, they announced him at, I think two ten or something. He was probably one ninety, but you couldn't say a, a pro wrestler was under 200 pounds in those days. People would have laughed at it like they should be now. But he could do the drop kicks and the flying shit and the head scissors. And when I saw him, it was on the tail end of his career. He was probably all right. Well, he just died. He was 85. So if I saw him 47 years ago, he was almost 40 then. But the idea, he was never in main events. He wasn't, a, you know, a main event guy, or did they push him as a main event guy? But you knew who he was because he was different. The flying Greek, Mike Pappas. He was the short guy that did all the fancy moves and flummoxed to the, the opponents where they couldn't catch him and they couldn't find him. And you could use him on the card. He meant more than just the average underneath babyface because of his unique style and his different little gimmick and the fact that he was of different size. And, you know, people liked him. And that's what we're missing today because, <clears throat> I mean, they just use guys in up and down the card against other heels or other baby faces, and, and there's no specific spot like that anymore. But that's the spot you would put him in. He had several runs in the WWWF, probably the smallest guy I would think that Vince Sr. ever pushed at all. But because, again, he had the... And it wasn't, again, like today where he was just doing ridiculous backflips off the top rope with people waiting to catch him on the floor and all that horse shit. He would do drop kicks and he'd do quick flying head scissors. And I remember, I've got a picture that I took at the gardens of him doing the headstand on the turnbuckle when guys would shoot him across the ring from buckle to buckle, he would go in forward and he would leap up and do a headstand with his feet up in the air on the top turnbuckle. And when the heel ran at him to try to get him, he would kick off over and land on his feet and do some snazzy move. Um, And it, again, a great classic underneath baby face that the people really liked and had his own gimmick and his own supporters. And the, the famous picture was in the centerfold of Wrestling World magazine that I think was taken in the WWWF territory of Andre holding Mike Pappas in his arm. The tall and the talented was the label of the Andre poster. But he's got Mike Pappas because Mike was the shortest guy on the card. So it made Andre look even bigger. That's the centerfold that I had Andre autograph for me when I first met him the very first time. But anyway, that's, you know, since uh, I guess Mike Pappas retired in the late 70s, 78, 79, and settled in Missouri, he had worked the central states some and opened up a jewelry store. And that's what he's been doing for the past 40 years. He became more well-known as a jeweler than he than he was maybe as a wrestler. But a nice guy. Just, I, I think I met him in passing as a fan one time to get the handshake, right? But I never really, you know, got to know him or anything. But 
one of those guys that you remember the name, you remember the way he worked because it was different, and the the fact that he was so short back in those days, which was so unusual, made him stand out even more. And that he was, you know, he was a little smiling guy with a, a bald spot on his head. So he looked his age, but he, you know, moved like a real, you know, younger athlete. And that's the flying Greek Mike Pappas. Not much footage of him out there. I don't think there's any. I don't. I'm trying to think uh, if I have seen any ever. I don't know where it would be from. It may be when he was in Florida. They they kept so many years of the Florida library. They kept Vern's AWA stuff. He didn't work there. Uh, For people who think you just hate small wrestlers, because you'll say it in a derisive fashion, and also you hate Gargano, but you know, here you are talking about the strengths of Mike Pappas. You talk about Bill Dundee, who was no more than four foot six, let's be honest. Oh, come on! I'm going to say Dundee's either 5'6 or 5'7, and he may have been, like everybody, he was an inch taller when he was younger, but he was also, for most of the time that he was wrestling, between 210, 225 pounds with that big chest, he could bench press his ass off, and he came across, and also because of the way he worked, he came across as punching above his weight, as they say in boxing. And believe me, if Dundee hit you with a working punch, he was punching above his fucking weight. Well, my question was going to be, yeah, the people who think that you hate small wrestlers or smaller wrestlers, wrestlers under five foot eight, what do they get wrong? They get, it's not, there's no rule of thumb. If, if Jim Londos was five foot eight, and he was the biggest box office attraction in the history of wrestling, but he had the big chest. Also, a hundred years ago, people were a little shorter. You didn't see a lot of fucking seven foot people walking around a hundred years ago, but it's the package. It's the appearance. It's the height and the weight and the way it's put together. If you've got a bulldog Brower, what was he? Five foot nine, five ten, but he was 270 pounds with that fucking huge chest. If, if you've got shorter guys, but they're bigger or you got bigger guys, but they're shorter. Or you, or you have a guy who's, I mean, Conor McGregor is not either tall or heavy, but he has a look, and he's a dynamite kid before he got on steroids to go to the WWF. He was, yeah, sure, 5'10", but he was 185, 190 pounds, but he looked like he was goddamn ripped and built in a laboratory. It's not, it, it, there's so many now small guys that look young because they are young they either can't figure out grow a beard get something to make you older i don't drink do drugs age yourself i don't fucking know but everybody that wants to get into the wrestling business looks like a small child both in terms of size in terms of face in terms of voice I mean, you know, and yes, they can kick the shit out of some people. But that that's not what this is about. It's not about can this five foot seven, 175 pound guy that's trained in judo or mixed martial arts kick the shit out of the guy working at the Exxon station. It's whether or not on television, this guy looks like he can kick the shit out of Roman Reigns or Brock Lesnar or fucking John Cena or goddamn in AEW. Did they have any tough looking motherfuckers? Well, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's the problem is that everybody looks now because there is, there's a, it's harder to get into the money in MMA, but there's more money in MMA now. And it looks like all the fucking Guys that look like men and look like badasses, whether it be the Jim Duggins or the Dr. Deaths or the Road Warriors or whatever the fuck, either don't exist anymore or want to be UFC fighters and not pro wrestlers. Because pro wrestlers, 
end up, especially at AEW, because of the EVPs and because of their taste in other men, a bunch of fucking kids that grew up in the backyard training themselves on their trampolines. And that does not convince the average American citizen or the average global citizen that this guy's a star and an ass kicker and a badass and a fucking wrestling champion. So again, it's not just about the size, it's about the whole package. But we can't be ridiculous and have a roster full of guys that are 220, 230, 240, 250, and then here comes a 160-pound guy with a fucking page boy haircut like Pip Sabian, and he's going to be competitive. Give me a Darby Allen's got a weird charisma. You know what? So there, Darby Allen, maybe he's the Mike Pappas of today because his shit at least looks good, even though he's a mental case. His shit looks good. And he looks like he's trying and he's taking it seriously. So maybe he's the Mike Pappas today. He's the guy. If you're going to have one, have one that has charisma, that people want to see as a personality, and that shit looks good. And then don't have any others because then they'll just detract from that guy. It's like every really skinny wrestler isn't the same. There's a difference between a Sean Waltman and a Kendall Windham. Boom goes the dynamite. There you go. And now somebody out there will not be able to figure out who we were complimenting, but hopefully the smart ones will get it. Yes, it was Sean. Yes, absolutely. But think about how many wrestlers, you know, you say it's about the whole package. There are other wrestlers who can have that physique and it wouldn't work the same way it did with Sean Waltman. Yeah, well, and there's other wrestlers that can be six foot six and 280 pounds and be built like Luger and they're still the shits, right? And, uh, I mean, we, if, if we're looking for a visually intimidating guy, the fucking tattooed face fucker on AEW, well, you wouldn't want to be walking down the street and see him because he looks like a homeless meth addict. Who else tattoos their fucking face? When we find out where the fuck this guy came from, we may very well find out he is a homeless meth addict. But he's got a look, so you'd be scared of him. But as we've seen... He can't fucking work. So Ed, that's part of the package too. Size, look, way you carry yourself, demeanor, work, aura. It's all there. All right, Jim, what may be and what probably is and what I think is going to be our final question here this week. Thank you for giving that a full-throated endorsement. This was sent to Corny Drive through at gmail.com from Chris in Shreveport, Louisiana, your old stomping grounds. As a longtime listener to your podcasts, I have heard several times about how Dusty Rhodes told the boys, quote, by this time next year, we'll be making <laughs> major motion, pic excuse me, major movies and sitcoms. I believe it's No, 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 pictures. you had it right. It's major motion pictures and sitcoms, baby. Well, I'm reading it now as he wrote it. I was trying to correct it, and then I said, I'll just read it, and then you corrected it anyway. So that was the quote. My question is this, why would Dusty think that would happen? Did he think the production companies would be at Crockett's door looking for more over-the-top characters to use in movies and sitcoms? Did he think that companies that could not get deals with the WWF would then come and make deals with JCP? Why on earth would Dusty expect to be making these kind of entertainment extravaganzas or that entertainment companies would want to hire the NWA wrestlers as opposed to Vince's prepackaged, family-friendly, over-the-top entertainers. It just seems like it was a pipe dream, and also maybe a way to help keep unhappy wrestlers quieted down for a time by making it seem they were all about to be on television and movie stars. Well, and there's an element of all of that, but the, the questioner, what was the person's name asking this question? Chris in Shreveport. Okay, Chris, here's the thing. The problem is you're looking with today's glasses on yesterday. Vince wasn't there yet either. With this, Dusty said that at a time where Vince didn't have any of his people in a fucking movie. When was Hulk's first movie? Besides Rocky Three, that was independent of. I'm talking about when did Vince actually start getting people in movies? 
Well, remember Jesse Ventura did movies, and I was outside of Vince's purview, and he got. Really but yeah, mad I'm about talking about the actual Piper Vince, too. Vince yeah, Hulk Hogan in movies. No Holds Barred was produced in 1988, released in 89. Okay, well, this was a couple of years before that. See, that's the thing is that it wasn't as far fetched as it, I got a kick out of the line. I was sitting in front of him when he said it on Crockett's plane. And other people heard it too. And of course, Dennis Condry, I think, you know, rolled his eyes. But it wasn't as far fetched as you would think in hearing it in that, in the way that the questioner just phrased it. At the end of 1986, Jim Crockett Promotions, without any pay per view, which didn't exist yet or wasn't a thing in wrestling yet, without any corporate sponsorship, just by and without TV rights, they didn't get paid for television. They paid to produce their television, right? So without any without any internet, which didn't exist, and without any international business because they weren't traveling outside of the United States and Ontario, Canada. In 1986, Crockett grossed over twenty million dollars on ticket sales. That's it. That's basically it. And which would be what? Um, three times that today. And it was still a regional territory that it was expanding. But $20 million plus. And we're drawing and selling out 10,000 seat buildings and 15,000 seat buildings already, sometimes twice in a day. And we are currently sitting on, while Dusty's about to say this, not it, that one. That was on the that was still on the Jabroni jet, the G1, the Gulfstream, the Crockett's first plane. He was about to buy a second one that was a jet instead of a prop jet, so we would eventually have two planes. We are on television in every city of any size in the country, doing good radio. I mean, in Charlotte, we can't walk down the fucking street. I've told the story about when I tried to go to the amusement park. We're on TBS as their highest rated program every week. And as a matter of fact, I think this may have been, well, no, that was later on when that learning the ropes thing came up, but there was a, a TV show involved there with Crockett also with Lyle Alzado. I was going to ask, point, is that the ultimate fruition of all this or is that separate from this? No, that was a separate thing. It was a Canadian production company and they probably couldn't work with Vince at that point. So that's, but it, it, Crockett made, very little from that and put very little effort into it. I got a question about that, and I may answer it on the experience this week because somebody emailed about it. But point is, we are in, all the guys that are there know that that is the most successful wrestling promotion that they've ever been a part of because except for Vince, in the same couple of years, it was the most successful wrestling promotion in the history of the United States, Crockett in 1986. So Dusty's there and Dusty always, he always, that's the thing. He thought creatively. He had the big ideas, the Starcade concept. Pay-per-view was right down his alley. I wish it had come along and Crockett had been able to get on it quicker than it happened. So because Dusty learned the big show and the package show, same way Watts did from Eddie Graham. And he peaked on those big shows and the Great American Bash and the stadium deals. And he thought big, and sometimes it was too big. We shouldn't have booked all those stadiums in 86. We, three or four of them we needed. The rest of them we could have done it indoors. But it was part of the big deal, the big attraction of the Great American Bash Tour. And Dusty, at that point, had an had ideas for making his own fucking movies or writing scripts at least with the guys because these guys were such fucking personalities so point he wanted, is, he wanted to write the scripts oh he would he'd tell you ideas on the plane but i tell you and you'll bear windham be the cowboy and then here come that no good tully blanchard he'd be the way and he's it's always a western usually but whatever but a lot of this stuff wasn't going to come to fruition because he wanted because, to do westerns. Well, and, and also, he, <laughs> but, I mean, he, he was dreaming big with the planes, and he named the plane. One plane was Stardust. The other plane was whatever the fuck it was. He thought big. He had tons of ideas. He created shit. 
And if you want, that, that's what you want in a booker rather than a fucking guy who's going to sit around like a bump on a log. Now Crockett needed to rein him in a little bit more in terms of how quick he wanted to take over the world because that's Dusty was also, that was the start of, we already had Kansas City and Florida was coming up. And I, d- I don't know whether they were talking at this point about the UWF yet, but Dusty was all over buying all the territories. He wanted to be the one opposition to Vince McMahon and he wanted to be the booker of it. And he was for a while and he did a good job at it. But the businessman, Crockett, should have reigned Dusty in somewhat and also should have had a better infrastructure. And that's where everything got sideways. They didn't know they were in the hole until they were way too far in the hole. But having said all that, I will wrap this up. That's why when the guys are sitting there, and that was Dusty's, he's looking around, we're on the plane, everybody's having fun, we've just sold out in Philadelphia or wherever the fuck we're coming back from, 10,000 people. And he said, boys, this time next year, we're going to be making major motion pictures and sitcoms. And yeah, part of it was Dusty's hyperbole, but at the same time, here we're making couple hundred thousand dollars a year, 30-something years ago, we're flying around in a private plane selling out fucking arenas every night. Maybe that ain't that far fucking fetched. But, it, it, you know, it, it, it became a quote later on that everybody started making fun of, like, how could he ever think that? Well, actually, it's, it was done in the wrestling business. He just wasn't able to to be in the spot long enough to see it done. But Vince ended up doing it with the guys made major motion pictures and sitcoms without a lisp. If you were in charge, would you have done the purchase of any of those of Florida in 87 of Kansas city? Was any of that actually worth it? And was there any voice actually saying, I guess to dusty more than anyone else. Cause dusty had Crockett's ear. This is a bad idea. They're going to go out of business if we don't buy them. What what are we buying? Well, the rest of the family didn't, because already they had started talking, and Dusty loved Texas. He's from Texas. And Crockett was fixated on Dallas as being a media center, that they and they rented those offices in Dallas, especially when they took over the UWF. They had the office in Dallas and blah, blah, blah. And... David and Jackie and Francis didn't want to leave the Carolinas and they didn't particularly want to run a national promotion, but it was, it was almost getting to the point where, and judging by everybody, all the other territories, if you didn't run a national promotion and try to compete with Vince, everybody, well, then that's it. You're fucking done. So uh, damned if you do, damned if you don't, as mama Cornette used to say. But Crockett and Jimmy and Dusty were all in on, we're going to be based out of Dallas, Texas, a major media center. We got the production company we can work with down there. We're going to have the, you know, the syndication and get all this advertising money and pay-per-views, a thing that's coming up. So we've got to have all the, they didn't buy the promotions for the promotions or the talent rosters. They bought them for the televisions. And especially the UWF. That was the whole idea. Right. Kansas City. Right. UWF more than the other two for the yeah, TV. Well, Kansas City was to be a developmental territory. And that's why, you know, at, at first he sent Bubba out there to be Big Bubba, to be the singles champion on his own because he wanted Bubba to get experience. Kansas City was going to be the developmental place and the place that you you know, sent guys if you didn't have anything for them or you brought guys into the program through that. Florida, I hate to say it, but Florida was probably a a bad idea because after Eddie Graham, the business had already gone down. And then once that Crockett took it over and it was a lot of TV tapings and et cetera, and it wasn't the local Florida promotion anymore, then the people down there revolted even farther than they already had because Florida had been so strong. When you when you have an area where a promotion has been exceptionally strong for a long time and then it goes away and another one comes in, the other one has a hell of a time following it. And that's 
You know, with Canada, they did a survey several years ago. In each province, how many people considered themselves a pro wrestling fan and how many didn't? And the highest percentage of people in a province in Canada that considered themselves wrestling fans, guess the two. Guess the two provinces. Quebec and Ontario. No, Ontario and Alberta. Oh, Alberta. Because of Calgary. I was thinking of Montreal. Montreal, but it had been a while longer. The Calgary, Montreal is a big, huge metropolitan city. Calgary, the legends lasted longer. The hearts were more over. And then Ontario, just because of Toronto. You know, but point being, Florida was dead and was going to die. And they should have, and there weren't enough TV outlets to make it worth it. But because of Dusty's, I think because of everybody's, you know, I don't want to say love for the Florida territory, but just the reverence that Florida wrestling had, we got to have this place and we'll get the TVs and it's right below Georgia. So it's, you know, it's adjacent to our already established territory, blah, blah, blah. But that didn't work out. It was a drain. And would it have been cheaper? Here's a, here's a question. Would it have been cheaper if Dusty and Crockett did Vince's business model? And just went to the station and said, we'll give you more money than you're getting right now. Would that have actually been the cheaper proposition for well, every one of those stations? It probably would have worked because I don't think the Florida stations were getting any money at that point. I I pretty much guarantee you Eddie Graham didn't give a TV station a fucking penny in Florida. But for all those years, but it was the highest rated program that anybody could get in Florida. So they took it. But I, if they just went in and started running it, that may have been a, you know, but they couldn't do that to Mike Graham and they couldn't have blah, blah, blah. And there was a Buddy Colt, I think, was still involved at that point, wasn't he? Or what? Anyway, but the biggest problem was the UWF, they bought that specifically for the television network that Watts and Jim Ross had assembled because they were the number three ranked promotion in terms of television coverage and jr had been assembling that syndicated network to try to fight vince but when their core business in the mid-south territory went under they couldn't afford the weekly nut watts was spending a fortune and he said fuck it i'll sell and crock it they were and that's another reason why people said oh they botched the uwf invasion well, they did. They could have introduced those guys stronger or better, but they didn't really botch something that they never really bought the company to do. They bought the UWF for the TV time slots, and it wasn't going to be a big invasion, and it wasn't going to be a big promotional rivalry. If they could have got that, it was, but, you know, at, at the same time, Dusty then had to figure, well, I got to keep the Horsemen and the Midnight Express and, you know, all of my top guys that are the rock and roll, if they were still there at that point, they, they left around that time. Whoever the top guys were that had been with him for Crockett, he had to keep them happy. He couldn't bring in guys that had stood out in a territory that wasn't going to be doing any business at the gate and start putting them over his established guys that were still doing business in the areas that Crockett was established, the Carolinas, Philadelphia, Baltimore. Yes, long term, it would have given more matches, matchups, and meant more, and those guys would have had a better shot. But there's too many of them. It came too fast, and it was just a clusterfuck. So you know, but but that's the thing, and that's what doomed Crockett was trying to put together that syndicated TV network that could uh, that could compete with Vince with the the advertisers and the sponsors that they were alleged that they would get if they got, what was it back in those days, Brian? If you had syndicated clearance in, was it 80% of the country or 85%, you could charge full advertising rates for a national program. I'm not sure. There was a formula for it back then. And that's why Jerry Springer, or, you know, fucking whatever, Wheel of Fortune, 
whatever any genre of syndicated program had to reach a certain threshold of percentage of the country, and it was definitely high 70s, if not 80, and then you would be considered as having pretty much full national coverage to sell national ad packages. And they were trying to take all those stations that UWF had, add them to their own, to the meager ones they got from Kansas City and Florida, and they got that coverage level. But because they were the second one in the game and they were unproven and it was under a variety of banners, the wrestling network, this was worldwide, this was Crockett, this was formerly UWF, whatever, Vince still had the fucking lead in syndicated television ad sales, even if the ratings were comparable, which they were. With that, the drive through is closed. Oh. I give up. All right. One wrong note is enough to ruin the day. Of course, we'll be back this weekend on the Jim Cornette Experience, the first one of 2023, wherever you find your favorite podcast, and back next week with the drive through The official Jim Cornette YouTube channel, just go to YouTube, search for Jim Cornette, full episodes, clips of episodes, omnibus collections. Check it out today, all with the popular Travis Heckle artwork, the official Jim Cornette. YouTube channel. Patreon.com slash Cornette. For $5 a month, you get access to the archive going back to 2013. The drive through any experience going back to 2013. Patreon.com slash Cornette. You can follow Jim on Twitter at the Jim Cornette. My voice cracked. At the Jim hey. Cornette. You can follow me on Twitter at Great Brian Last. You can hear me on the 605 Super Podcast at 605pod.com, available wherever you find your favorite podcast. And don't forget to subscribe to The Wrestling News, wherever you find your favorite podcast, or at thewrestlingnews.com. Cornet's Collectibles at jimcornet.com. Cameo time. What's going on, Jim? St. Valentine's Day Massa Cameos is back on Saturday, January 28th at noon Eastern. We're going to put up 75 or 80. That's all we have time to shoot that week. They will go quickly. Go to jimcornette.com and click on the Cameo button at the appropriate time or go to cameo, C-A-M-E-O dot com slash Jim Cornette. And remember, the store reopens for the brand new year on this coming Monday, January the 9th. At jimcornette.com. That's where it's at. The drive-thru is brought to you by the law office of Stephen Pinu, 888-692-8084. Get even with Stephen at newlawoffice.com. But until this weekend on The Experience, and next week right back here on The Drive-Thru, for Jim Cornette, I'm the great Brian Last. Tally-ho!